everyone will certainly recognize Dr. King when the interview starts, but my name is uh, Don Newton, and I'm a former resident of uh, Dr. King's back at the uh, Cornell days. Presently, I'm at uh, North Carolina State University, and it was my good fortune to have worked with him for years. And uh, I feel very lucky today and honored that they've asked me to uh, interview you for apparently the first in a series for the Charles uh, L. Davis Foundation for the Legends of Veterinary Pathology. And I think it's a very fitting beginning that they should have you up here first. So, good day. Thank you, Donald. How's it feel from your perspective to have been invited here? Uh, As a legend. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know where they ever got that idea about me because I don't have that feeling about myself. I still enjoy what I do and I haven't left it, so I'm still active, so that's great. And I'm glad for that opportunity, but I think you're a little bit uh, too kind in all the laudations you've just given me by saying I've been that nice to some of you because I think I treated all of you with a with a tough, uh, I wanted to be proud of you. So mm -hmm. I was tough and I expected a heck of a lot out of all of you. And in most instances, I got it. And I'm grateful for that. I think because you set that hurdle so high, and you did, and you pushed us, that um, maybe when we were going through it, that there are times that we didn't enjoy it, but the fact that we uh, survived, you made us uh, better. Well, the alternative, you could have been truck drivers, <laughs> as, I've, <laughs> as I've told many, and they don't like that. But they should understand that, that I'm proud of veterinary pathology and all of the people who have been in it before me who made it uh, so darn good for all of us who followed them. Mm -hmm. Well, we're going to have the opportunity to talk a lot about veterinary pathology, we hope. Uh, but tell us something about uh, you and... Uh, your beginning, because I think as part of the historical perspective, they're going to want to know some of the personal sides of uh, Dr. King. So tell us something about the roots. Uh, I was born a long time ago. That starts way back. And I remember during the Depression eating beans with sugar, and I loved it. And I also remember going to a Mrs. <coughs> Crow's home in Massachusetts with my, my younger sister, two years older than I was, and uh, we lived in this home. And we had actual flour sacks with holes for our neck and our two arms. And I loved it. Uh, and I'm surprised I loved it. And I don't remember anything bad about it. Because we had rice three times a day. And I still love rice. But then at that boys, then I went to a boys school because my folks went to Splitsville. And my three sisters went with aunts, aunts. And I didn't know who to go to or they didn't know who to where to put me, so I went to a boys' school for seven years. And I remember crying the first night. Hmm. And, uh, but at that boys' school, I learned something about the animals because we had cows and pigs and chickens. It ended up I stayed there for 10 years. How old were you when you went there? About? Seven. And I stayed there for 10 years, maybe 11, I don't really quite remember, and until uh, I joined the Army. And that was a fantastic hmm. experience, the Army. It was the first time I was way away, away from home, or away from any, anything, and I had a great time in the Army for four years. But at that boys' school, there was a veterinarian who came down from uh, Wellesley or Natick, Massachusetts, who was our veterinarian, and he ended up writing a book called The, the Horse Doctor. Hmm. And I was the one who was, uh, now remember the boys' school went up to the eighth grade. But I didn't even have a home to, to go to when I was uh, got ready to go to high school. So I stayed at that school and went to high school. Walked every morning a uh, couple miles to get the school bus. I had typing the first class. And my hands wouldn't thaw out until 10 in the morning. So, of course, I didn't pass the uh, typing course. But I had a good memory in those days. And I, I guess it's okay now. I don't forget too much, especially the things I'm trying to teach. Well, maybe I do, and nobody's, everybody's too kind to tell me I've forgotten. I don't know. And that was all a pretty good experience with that old-time veterinarian. 
and uh, he taught us or taught me such things as uh, he saved all of his his uh, cigar stubs and he used hmm. those to keep the insects off of the uh, his ro his wife's rose bushes. And that was pretty neat. And then when I finally learned about nicotine sulfate is in vet school, another thing, another little thing uh, clicked forever mm -hmm. in my mind under those conditions. What was his name again? Did you say? It began with an H, but I'll be darned if I can, wasn't Harriet, but uh -huh. I can't remember the name right now, but I just remember Hirsch, Hirsch something, but I don't know. He went to Harvard uh, when Harvard had a veterinary school in uh, 1907 or something like that. Good I man. Re I didn't realize they had a vet school. They had one of the first ones, but it didn't last very long. And then he also uh, he had something to do with Middlesex. That was a uh, school or some veterinarians still alive who probably went there. And that that faded out early. So he's or the just one after the war. Yeah. He's the one that really got you interested in. Veterinary medicine? In animals, because I took care of all the cows that needed. He would tell me what to do. I didn't know what I was doing. That was a fault in my, in my youth. They, at that boys' school I was, they didn't tell you how much milk this cow gave or how much fertilizer you put on this field or how many bushels of potatoes us, us kids uh, would have to pick uh, from this, this field, this so much acreage. Mm -hmm. I had no idea about that, and I think that was a that was a mistake. But it was 80 boys at that school, and uh, one adult man who taught everything. So he couldn't do everything, and I, to this day, I idolize him. Mm -hmm. But uh, that's okay. That's what started me, and I always wanted to be a veterinarian. The Daughters of the American Revolution took care of the school a lot on the side. They gave us a little bit of bucks, and every winter they gave us uh, mittens that they had knitted for us and stuff like that. Because I had actually gone to high school with, with rubber boots because I couldn't walk in the snow with regular, and I'd have to go through school with rubber boots and up to my knees. And uh, so I didn't, we didn't learn anything about women in those days. Haven't learned a lot since either. <laughs> I was going to comment <laughs> whether or not that explains some of the uh, roots as well of you. So we didn't style. know any, anything about the women. And the rubber boots, I don't think that endeared me to any of the high school kids. But uh, I had a good time there too. I makes it sound everything. like the Army would be plush after that uh, beginning. It was, and they paid me to be in the Army. You know, I got $50. Uh, I became a paratrooper there, and I had a fabulous time with my extra 50 bucks. I sent it to my mother. and hmm. uh, <laughs> Good. Yeah, I enjoyed the Army, too. Mm -hmm. And then when you finished the Army, then it was undergrad? or I married. Uh, I met my wife. She was in the uh, Marie. She was in Wilmington, Delaware, and she was in the YWCA, and she came down to Aberdeen Proving Grounds every once a week with the gals from the uh, YWCA from Wilmington. And I met her there, and I remember the first thing I said, dance, ma'am, and she didn't like me. Well, that was okay. I, my shiny boots and my patch and my cocky hat, probably my cocky attitude, I guess I swept her off her feet, and that was in 1947. Mm -hmm. I just returned from Germany, and... Uh, and we got married in November. That was very good. So your 50th anniversary will be next year? Yes. Mm -hmm. Congratulations. Thank you, Dad. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You got anything big planned for? No, we're going to be, gonna be, we're gonna be overseas, uh, I guess. No, in December we won't be. No, we'll be back from uh, South America then by next June. Mm -hmm. No, nothing planned. I, I'm not sure I want anything. Maybe we'll buy a big new boat by then, but we'll, I'll still be working, so good. don't want to retire too early. Because as soon as you retire too early, you cannot be a bone of contention to anybody. I can't imagine you ever retiring. Not well, entirely, and I know I'll have to adjust to it at some point. I can't call you up and ask you about things, but I can't ever imagine it will happen. Hable at school says, if you care for Cornell, you won't retire. 
unless you want to die in a saddle because it'll probably kill you to continue the political fighting and all that kind of stuff. Well, I, I stay out of some of it because I try to hide in the necropsy room, as you know. You don't back down from many battles, though. No, but I don't leave the necropsy room to, to battle very often, <laughs> so I'm pretty lucky in that job, too. Let's see. Uh, married after we got, Yeah, we got married a year later. I had, I had to have my mother's permission because I wasn't 21, but uh, she was over 18. She was 20 also. So uh, she didn't have to have permission, and that was kind of a put down for me, you know, because here I am, a great big <laughs> strapping. Army guy? Yeah, paratrooper, not just army. You Sorry. Know? I mean, the army, those guys walked. We jumped. <laughs> I stand corrected. <laughs> No, I was a cocky little devil then, too. I enjoyed that. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then it's undergrad. Yes, we went to the University of Delaware. I wrote to Oklahoma and trying to get in all the vet schools. They wouldn't take me in Cornell or Penn because they had a quota hmm. from Delaware and New Jersey. That hurt my pride a little bit. But I flunked high school. Well, I didn't flunk it. I didn't finish it too well because... Uh, I never did homework, never, and uh, I'm not proud of it, but mm -hmm. there are several th courses that gave me a hard time that I just didn't study. So when I got in the Army and wanted to go to vet school, because I knew I wanted to go to vet school, uh, I had to take all these Army qualification tests, and I did pretty well. And they said, well, first you should be a lawyer, and that explains, <laughs> <lawyer>. why, I <laughs> that explains why I'll argue with yep. Peter at the gate, you know. Uh, and then the second thing you probably your best aptitude is for is veterinary medicine. Hmm. So that was that was neat. <coughs> and uh, we got a GI bill for $105 a month because I was married and I was in the Army for four years and I got 48 months of school but I always would uh, enroll about six weeks late and so I didn't get my uh, my $105 for the first six weeks, but that gave me an extra six weeks. So I went all through school, undergraduate and vet school, under the GI Bill. And that was a fabulous opportunity that I took advantage of. And, and uh, we went both to University of Delaware for undergraduate, <coughs> excuse me, and uh, then we went to Oklahoma A&M now Oklahoma State University. The education there was fantastic. You could do anything you wanted. There was no strings attached. We didn't have much faculty. So that means uh, you did a lot at the veterinary school on a practical basis. <coughs> and that, you know, the, there just wasn't enough faculty to do it. But they were dedicated teachers, and gee, I had a great time with all of them. A couple of them gave me heck. One of them even gave me a, a D in clinic. Attitude? Uh, yes, cocky attitude. And I don't know where he got that from, but I remember doing things like uh, walking a needle off the uh, bodies of the vertebra and going into the aorta, injecting the radiopaque material and see where how my surgery on the aorta worked or on the femoral artery or some vessel. Mm -hmm. And it worked great. And uh, but because I didn't have his permission to use his radiograph, uh, the x-ray machines or the, what do they call them? The x-ray machines. <laughs> yeah. Anyhow, yeah. So uh, to use those things, he gave me a D. And also because, uh, I mean, I knew how to do it. He had taught me well, and, but you're supposed to have permission. I didn't use it. So he gave me a D. And afterwards, I found out, well, why did you give me a D? I said, you said good things about me. You would recommend me to any veterinarian who wanted a good, energetic young man to do something. But you gave me a D. He says, well, your attitude. You're too cocky. <laughs> I didn't appreciate that then, and I'm not sure I appreciate even now because I was willing to do something. If the other kids didn't want to do it, I'll do it. Would he think you've mellowed since those days? Uh, would any of us think you've mellowed no, since the early days? Not really. Pansier, he went back to Oklahoma and he was there all the time. And I'd write him a letter and I'd tell him to tell that professor so-and-so. 
I'd probably cussed in those, uh, in those times. Probably told him to tell him off, but maybe I should have listened because, you know, who knows? I could have been president of Cornell or North Carolina Still or someplace be. like that if I'd kept my darn mouth <laughs> shut. But at that boys' school, that old man who taught us, he was Pop Sanford, he said, Will you stop getting the last word? Yes, sir. Didn't you hear me? Yes, sir. And uh, that started it. That started it. But I was about nine years old when he said that. I remember it so well because he did get uptight with me for doing that. Yes, sir. No, sir. And worse yet today is yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am. Do you realize the number of women who hate that ma'am stuff? But if I didn't say yes, ma'am, and no, ma'am to somebody, I wouldn't get any dessert. So I had 10 years training, and it, it sunk in after a while. If I want dessert, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. Not going to change that uh, pattern. Uh, oh, things are changing today, and maybe I better change. That's what I want to get into at some point in some of the changes, but let's finish some of the uh, background. Uh, how many students in your vet class and any classmates that uh, we should know about? Uh, we graduated with 32, one girl, uh, not one too many young ladies, if you ever listen to this, we should have more of you. Uh, more than one or more than what we have today? Uh, well, this is kind of political, so probably we won't continue that okay. too much. We'll drop that line. Yeah, we'll drop that line. Uh, no, actually, the women are just as good as men, and they'll do just as fine as all the men. They're, they're nicer to teach. One reason is they do smell better, um, and they just smell good. And then when you hear a little clickety click down the hall, you have to wait till they go by your door to see who's making that little clickety click. Mm -hmm. I've always appreciated that, but now I can't make any comments on that, you know. Um, Got to be really careful now. Had uh, any troubles? Uh, twice. I've been to the dean, I've been to, well, I've been to my chairman, I've been to the dean, and I've been to the president of the university. But uh, in talking about such things as unilateral shutdown and atrophy of the oh. kidney, for instance, you know, yep. when you have to tie off, or if accidentally you, for instance, tie off the wee-wee. Yeah, tell us that story. Uh, I'm, I may chime in sure with this one. Are you sure you want me to in <laughs> here? Uh, well, you know, when you're, uh, you're a prisoner and you're captured and somebody, they want the information out of you and they're going to punish you or torture you. And how they do that is they tie off your uh, wee-wee. Well, I use the other word. Mm -hmm. And uh, that went in the letter to the president that I was being, uh, I don't know, well, vulgar or something. Well, actually, that did come up, that it was being vulgar. Mm -hmm. And, but it's a good thing because in cats, where it's so common, they'll get calculi in the penile urethra and uh, it'll block both kidneys. One will shrink and one will stay normal and stuff like that. Everybody calls it hypoplasia, but that kidney was normal beforehand. And the reason I know is several veterinarians said that's what we, what we uh, the cat was blocked and we washed him out and we opened his belly, his kidneys were good, everything was good. But now here he's six months later and look, one kidney's small, one's big. That was the first clue. I mean, veterinarians said it, but I needed that proof to say that it wasn't hypoplasia, because how many times you see hypoplasia in little, in young animals? Mm -hmm. uh, not very often. Right, especially one so, side. Yeah. So, anyhow, so this is something different. And then when I proceeded to tell everybody, everybody usually laughs and giggles, unless they have an axe to grind with you for some reason, my cocky attitude. So. Uh, then they, somebody said, well, why do you use that example? I said, hey, it's a good one. And anyhow, I thought I was teaching in a veterinary school, not Sunday school. Well, <laughs> that went to the top. But they understood it. And uh, How do you get unilateral renal shutdown from that? God said so. Don't you realize? You don't know why any of your animals die, because I'll bet you whatever, mm -hmm. any animal you autopsy, you've seen another animal that had more wrong with him than that, and you had to kill the other one, and this one died. So that animal's just a wimp, you know. He died with his abdomen full of something, some disease and pestilence, and 
he died with it, but others have worse, and you had to kill him. So there's no good explanation for a good general diagnostic pathologist to explain death. Recently, all these cows we had at school, uh, 38 of them, and uh, nine of them died, including one great big Angus bull I was glad died because he challenged me when I got in the pen with him. I didn't even know he was sick, but he kind of put his head down, was going to tell me to get out of that pen. Well, I got out, but... This was recent? Yeah, about three months ago. Hmm. Anyhow, I got out of the pen, so what... So why would that... Uh, nine of them died. All with diarrhea. I beg your pardon. None of them with diarrhea. But they died suddenly. We would died so suddenly we thought of poisoning. Uh, except that two of the nine had lesions. One little North Carolina graduate found them first, actually. Elizabeth, Elizabeth? Malden. Yeah. yeah. And that was pretty neat because, you know, she's taught by you and probably by us and some yeah. to look for everything. And she found these things in the esophagus. And they didn't find anything in the gut until I got there. But that makes me, hey, this job security for me. I don't want to teach them everything because mm -hmm. I wouldn't have a job if they knew all that. So anyhow, she found it. And they, we isolated the virus and uh, on FA, and they actually got the virus, but they also found it in immunohistochemistry and uh, FA. Hmm. What is it? BVD. Oh. But no diarrhea. Hmm. Pyrus and patch lesions? When you showed yes. up. Yes. When I showed up, they had some. But come on, these, these young people, it's not an easy job because everybody said poisoning. But yeah. she found those esophageal lesions. Then Fox get in on the act and Dubovi and all of our hot shots at school who are good. And they get in on the act and, yeah, it's BVD. But why no diarrhea? So why do animals die with bovine virus diarrhea? That gets tricky if they don't mm -hmm. have diarrhea. Now, I've seen a lot of them die with diarrhea and no lesions. But then you say, oh, yeah, electrolyte imbalance and right. they died. Mm -hmm. But that gets tricky. Anyhow, that was nice. Yeah. So we don't know all the answers to everything and... And that's where we started, unilateral renal shutdown. Oh, yeah. Renal, I, I got to chime in with one thing in there. that, that I know that story's gotten you in trouble. And uh, you on the road with your show and tell buckets and a black box and so forth. And when you came to Carolina, um, you told that story on the unilateral renal shutdown. And uh, there were two people out in the audience that day. One was my grad student, uh, and I won't use the uh, names, but she preferred to work uh, in the... Uh, uh, ultra-structural lab, much less the gross necropsy floor, uh, but for the boards and other reasons, she wanted to hear you. And I told her, I said, well, I want to make sure you hear this uh, professor of mine. And then when you decided to tell the story and you chose whose penis was going to be tied off, <laughs> you pointed to her husband. <laughs> <laughs> and then went through all the details and all the explanations, and I thought Kathy was going to, well, there's part of the name, I thought she was going to come up out of the chair at some point in that story. <laughs> <laughs> and I know it's gotten you in trouble over the years. Yeah, that, that's kind of, that's kind of a backlash, I guess, a little bit. Yeah. Maybe, and we actually deserve it, because we have no right to be crude and mean to anybody, but in a veterinary school, you should, I mean, I think we should be allowed a little bit like that. And if you whack your nail or finger with something, you ought to be able to cuss a little bit. And that's the only reason. I bet she'll always remember unilateral renal shutdown. I hope so. Yep. Because <laughs> it's real. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And the impact of that story helps. Yeah, and, uh, but you can't, you can't be free anymore to say what you want in some of the classes because the kids are a little more sensitive and they can take advantage of it if you're their friend or you were their friend or something. If they want to, uh, they can take advantage of it. Mm. And, and they'll say, well, you took advantage of us for, you know, 400 years as men and maybe it turn about a little bit it's fair play. But when it falls on me, I don't, I didn't appreciate it. I don't appreciate it. You want to talk a little bit about how the classroom has changed over the years? Uh, well, the women are more dedicated than most men, hmm. I think. And the women are certainly just as smart, or maybe they're no smarter, but they're not as driven by their hormones, I guess, as men are. 
because men are always looking for something a little exciting, a little different. And women are, are not quite that uh, blatant. But that's not veterinary medicine. So I think that's just school. Our curriculum is changing. And uh, it's going to case-based learning. And uh, a lot of the tutors are not veterinarians. And I find that is a kind of a shame because the students don't have the veterinary students do not have veterinarians as role models, good ones or bad ones, but at least you ask a veterinarian something on dogs or cats or cows or horses, they will give you something. And a research type PhD fellow, he's, they're the best citizens in the world, the best husbands, the best uh, whatever in the world, the best teachers on the C and B or the T and B cells, uh, something like that. Mm -hmm. They know that very detail. But I'm not sure our veterinary students should have so much of that even available to them because these, these fellows, women, they will teach that because that's what they know best. And uh, some of our faculty, you know, in some departments, uh, we, we have some in s different areas and they're, they're, vet they're not veterinarians. And so they'll not be teaching veterinary subjects and when they get graduate students, the biggest Almost the biggest gripe to me is that they, they don't get DVMs, just a simple young DVM, 23 or 4 years old, to teach to get a PhD in their subject. And, and, uh, and why? Because it costs too much to, the veterinarian already has to pay his, uh, his school loans off, whereas a master's degree in biological science on, on some other campus, you know, you don't have to pay him so much because he didn't owe so much money like the veterinarians, mm -hmm. veterinary students. So that's a fault for the thing. But maybe it's not a fault. And I'm, I'm holding my final opinion on it because when uh, Cornell went to full-time um, students, I mean all-year students with the seniors, I guess we wanted warm bodies instead of, instead of paying summer crews, we went to warm bodies and so we used seniors all year round. So now this, and I knew everybody was going to complain about it because the students were going to be in school, the seniors all year, and the faculty was going to be uptight because you don't get a break from students for a little bit of time. I know Texas has always done it all year or something like that, or mm -hmm. maybe some schools have. Is it just senior year? Right? Just a senior yep. year, yes. And uh, I knew everybody was going to really hate it. I knew they were all going to gripe and moan because of this. And the outcome is I haven't heard one gripe from anybody, the students, the faculty, or myself, for instance. I think it's fabulous. Instead of having four students or five mm -hmm. each rotation, we only have three because they have to divide up their year from, for the 80 students. And uh, the students can leave town anytime they want to, you know, for their externship blocks, you know, stuff like mm -hmm. that. I haven't heard anybody gripe, and we know every for every two weeks we're going to get three new students, mm -hmm. and you can plan on that, and it's not bad. So if I was so wrong there on such a major change in uh, academia, maybe I'm wrong in this other way too. I I don't think I am because I don't think I am, but who's to say I'm not? Because. As an old, older uh, instructor, gee whiz, I think I've got lots to offer them, but you don't see them. Mm -hmm. And therefore, uh, and other teachers, great teachers, have the same kind of a, uh, a feeling that something's missing for these young people. In these case studies, have they sought you out to help solve some of these? Because that's how they theoretically get exposed to these people. Um, maybe that's one reason I'm a little disheartened. They haven't done it as much as I think they should have. Mm. And therefore, maybe, maybe I'm, I'm tender and uh, my feelings are hurt or something like that. So maybe that's a fault. But I've heard it from too many others who have the same opinion and who aren't as old as I am. So y you have to give them a break and you can't condemn, you can't kill a messenger or shoot the messenger and they, that's what these young people are they're the ones who are bringing you know the fact that yep. they don't they don't know something you can't shoot him for not knowing it because they probably didn't teach him but I honestly don't know so 
I, just the proof of the pudding. It will be in uh, when they get out and when they have to compete with everybody else. When they come in a post-mortem room, you know, you know that large animal that they do cows, they do horses. But large animal anatomy is only an elective now at school. They don't even have a peristology course. So if I ask them, well, name the, uh, what's a tongue worm? What's the esophageal worm? Uh, they don't have a clue. And I feel that is wrong, and they'll never have opportunity to, to speak up. Maybe I have been like, I treat some of them like adults, <laughs> like you residents, I would treat you like adults and give you heck if you miss something and constantly give you heck. And this is how yep. I like to teach. When you're, when you're in school, uh, I don't let you make a final decision if you're a student on anything. I check everything you do, and I think I should. I think some schools don't do that. They have the resident, and I'm talking about residents, I guess. Mm -hmm. As a resident, you go out That's to the okay. postmortem room, and uh, if you need help, call me, I'll come out and look. Well, yeah. that's kind of baloney in the sense that how do you know you need help or you don't need help? That list of things I gave you, a lot yeah. of those things are, are uh, if you've never known it, you'll never think to look. Uh, if you do a complete post, you'll do a pretty good job on most. You won't miss a lot. But you're not looking for all uh, the little things as a senior. So you could, you can miss some of it. That's why we have a job, guys like me. I think it's great. Somehow, as a, uh, a resident, you taught me to look. And part of that may have been fear, because you were going to come in, or you were over there in the corner working on something else, and you'd be over there. Uh, today, sometimes it seems the residents look for the disease that they were told about in the history. And I don't know how to overcome that. Oh, uh, I do. Uh, do it the way I do it, of course. That's why I do it my sure. way, of course, you know. I'm just uh, the straight man in this. <laughs> that agree. That avoid. <laughs> uh, don't read the history. Yeah. So I don't read histories ahead of time. They hate that. Pardon? They hate it. Oh, and I don't blame them. Especially I don't blame the seniors because they want all they want all the help and they need all the help they can get. And I don't blame them for that. But the residents, I kind of bump them a little bit hard. Uh, and when I come up to them and say, "Well, wh what do you think that is?" The other day. A good little story. Uh, I threw an ear tag. It was in a bucket, uh, an ear with an ear tag in it from a cow. Yeah. I said, "Okay, what's your diagnosis?" Well, that slowed everybody down. And I says, "Well, is it a new ear tag?" Yes. And this is an educational thing for everybody listening. Uh, sure. Is it a new ear tag? Sure. Well, why would a cow have a new ear tag? I'll leave my life. It was me. Sure. I got a. I got a new ear tag on this cow, Donald, uh, on this cow's ear. What did it die from? Uh, must be sudden death. So Good. Lightning so or could have been one of those things. But why a new ear tag? Anaphylaxis. A new ear tag. Okay, so it's not all that easy. Mm -hmm. But why would you put a new ear tag in an old cow on a farm? Right. You probably wouldn't. wouldn't. Yep. Yeah. So you'd probably or a sick cow. Yeah, you wouldn't put it yep. in a sick cow's ear. Yeah. And but uh, how about a new cow on a farm? Would you have that? Would you put a new ear tag and a new cow on the farm? Yeah. And you bought it at the, at the auction. Sure. Right. Now where's that auction? Next door, or it might be in Albany. Right. Cornell. Yeah. How'd you get it to Cornell? Did you, the farmer, walk that cow and feed her a piece of hay every now and then, and all the way to Ithaca? So yeah. no, you probably shipped it. shipped it. Now what what disease do you get when you ship cows? A shipping fever. Very good. So huh. I make them think like that. I don't yeah. want to, I never ask them a question that's, you know, everybody knows the answer to. There's, there's no teaching value in that. So this is how I really teach. Now some students, especially this new curriculum, I've just had a little problem with a uh, young lady that I would pick on her for that because we had been friends before and she'd do this. And I expected this out of her because she had been to many show and tells, whereas the other two fellows in the class had never been. I don't remember ever seeing him at a show and tell. Well, he might have been there. And uh, so I picked on her, and that really got to her. And she got to her again that I had a, I didn't have to go see the dean. I had to go see the dean of students, but that's something else. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of embarrassing in a way, but it takes the spontaneity and the fun out of teaching. Yeah. 
as you get older because you can't get away with grinding it all the way. But they can. Oh, they can. Well, that's something else. That's their new freedom, and they can take advantage of that and, uh, and complain that I don't think is necessary. Now, I can, uh, and I expected more out of her, so I didn't give her the top grade. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but it's my, my she, has, she has 25 classes like this all year, and mine's just going to average in there. It won't hurt her very much. But if it's early on in her training, and she better think that some of us old geezers are not going to put up with that. Mm -hmm. But that's okay. What, what? Uh, let's see. And Olufsen did this. Olufsen would sit there, and all the old timers, I mean, all the students who graduated before 60, 1960 something, Olufsen would ask this question, and it, okay, what is it? And he'd stand there like this, and those students, they don't have a clue what this brown piece of dumpling is in a bottle of formaldehyde or something like that. And uh, they'd look at it, and he's waiting, and he's waiting, and it'd be three minutes, complete silence. Everybody standing on their feet, he's sitting on a stool, moving back and forth, and he would be gruff, and then he would, uh, they had to answer him politely and properly, and they did. Uh, but, or they couldn't answer, and oh, he had, he had fried them like that. He fried them, because they s stood in place and sizzled, I think. <laughs> all of them, the grand old man. Mm. And he's, for years afterwards, you know, when he stopped teaching, I'd visit him every week or so, and we'd talk, and I'd say, hey, boss, you scared the heck out of everybody. And mm -hmm. uh, he said, no, I didn't. I said, yes, you did. And, uh, that I'll come back and I'll tell him how much he scared him. Like you did this morning. You said, well, you scared me. I never scared you. Oh, <laughs> without a doubt you did. <laughs> I, do you remember the time you sent me back to the buckets to pull out the legs? And oh, I would do cow? that. I would do that just to, because I don't believe anybody. Yeah. And we, I have good reason not to believe anybody. Not that I'm smart, but come on, I've seen it. And that's what makes a little difference between uh, an academic, an academic, uh, than somebody outside doing diagnostic stuff. Outside, there's a tendency, I think, because I was outside for six years, uh, there's a tendency to start believing yourself. Whereas at school, I don't think I've ever asked a question that residents or undergraduates wouldn't jump me about and try to tell me I'm wrong. Or a new resident, because if you came from well, you came from Ohio. I mean, you were from Cornell, but then you went away and you get some education mm -hmm. Ohio and other places. And then when you come back, it, it's put you down. It's put Dr. Mutant down to, to make him think real hard. And don't give me that things you think you learned someplace else, but except I would ask you and you would give it to me. Yep. And, then, and the way to teach is I said, well, you don't know what it is. I said, I know you don't know what it is. Otherwise, I wouldn't have asked you that question because I know you don't know, but I want you to think about it. Well, I don't know what it is. I said, well, you think it's a brain. You know, you're looking at a elbow of a, yeah. of something. I said, well, do you think it's a brain? No, well, at least you know the anatomy. So do you think it's tumor? Do you think it's infection? Do you think it's parasitic? You must be thinking something because why do I ask you like that? Because there's 14 other or 40 others or 80 others right there they don't know. They don't know either, and they're so glad you're under the, <laughs> you're, you're under these diff league lights. You know? Yeah. And uh, so they want you to get stuck, and uh, so I'm trying to make you think a little bit. What about the resident today or the vet student today? Do they take the heat as well as we did or the generation before that? The, of that type of questioning, being put on the spot. Uh, that's why I think the new student is, um, the up and coming student, doesn't like it as much. Uh, and, but I don't, I don't care if they don't like it. I mean, it doesn't bother me that much. Mm -hmm. Although I understand their, their reluctance, and if they don't show up, then I can't teach them anything. So I think I either have to mellow a little bit because I want more of them to show up, even just to listen to me, knowing I won't question them too hard. Uh, some students don't mind, and 
Those students are the better students. They're wonderful to teach. They don't mind being wrong. They want me to, to correct whatever they think, and it doesn't hurt their feelings. But if yeah. you get some little prima donnas, men or women, you can hurt their feelings. But I don't know I'm hurting their feelings because I think, well, gee, I know me pretty well. I've lived with me for, what, 52 years, you know. Maybe a little bit longer. Give or take. Give or take a little bit, yeah. And uh, so I know how I am, but they don't might know it. So maybe I got to mellow for that reason or maybe apologize. But then when I find a couple who are pretty good, man, is that great. Because they answer the questions, they don't wait. And remember, I only have an hour on, on, on my show and tell periods. I used to have yeah. almost every day, and now it's cut down a bit. Uh, I don't have time to wait like Olafson did. But he only did during a quiz. And that student had his four minutes or five minutes. And if he stood there mute, mutant, mm -hmm. for, five, for five minutes, you know. Uh, that was it. Yeah, that was it. That was bad, bad news for that young person. Young man, usually, because he didn't have too many women. Uh, How often do you run your show and tell now? It, it, w it eventually made it to be a double header on Fridays, didn't it? Yes, but there's not that much interest in it right now. I don't know why. So we just have it Friday. But we still have, uh, during the summer, we have lots of Spaniards here this summer. And they're wonderful to teach hmm. because there's uh, five of them and we're going to have six, one coming up and all. They're wonderful to teach because they all want to know. And uh, they're not used to my, well, I don't know, what is it, my... Uh, Style? My style, they're not used to it, but they don't understand that I'm really giving them heck if they don't answer it in a, in a hurry. And if I go on to somebody else, they don't understand that I really expected them to say something. And I sometimes speak in Spanish a little bit, you know, some words, because I'm learning Spanish slowly. But anyhow, they're there and they're wonderful to teach because they're always interested. And they want to get it because in their countries, you know, other countries, they don't have this discourse between the professor. And one, it's not that it's not good or they don't recognize that. It's that they have 450 students in a class. And if every student in asks a question, yes. And if every student, or 250, I'm sorry, in m all of four German schools, 250. Mm -hmm. And other schools, they get, you know, 150 or 200 or 300. And if every student asked a question, who would ever have time to teach? If all the students asked one question, you answer it. Well, you never get anything taught that way, I guess. So the Spaniards, well, all of the foreign kids are nice. And when we get, you know, you're like your young Elizabeth from North mm -hmm. Carolina. Uh, she's learned lots of things, but she speaks up just like that. She's a, being a sexist, she's a cute okay. little Southern uh, debutante. I mean, she's a nice gal. But she goes right along with it, and she'll answer immediately and wrong right. or right she'll answer and it's nice because she's going in she's joining the game now and she was pretty quiet when she showed up yeah. right and she answers more questions correctly by far and it's a pleasure to teach them yeah yeah but I'm lucky to have residents if all I had was undergraduates I'd find that a little more difficult mm -hmm. because you can't expect that much out of them and so I like the residents uh, I teach both every morning at eight o'clock we have a histopathology seminar. It used to be that I'd make them read them ahead of time. Yeah. That gets, and I don't give them any history. How you many know, slides? 15-ish? 20, 20, 25, yeah. Just the little boxes. And uh, so now I just show 15 or 25 slides and I show the lesions on, on a scope, multi-head multi scope or something like that. And then I'll, I don't ask them questions about the slide because as I'm showing it, you know, they'll see the, every time you have mycotic enteritis, you expect thrombosis. Otherwise, you probably don't have mycotic, throm you know, enteritis. And if I, so, if I show thrombosis, I would expect Elizabeth or anybody, yeah, that's mold. Huh. But then I'd say, well, why did they get it? Because that's not in that slide, why they got it or didn't get it. And they don't have the history. And they better say, hey, it was given too much antibiotics or it's overeating if it was in the abomasum or something like mm -hmm. that. I'd expect them to know that. And uh, So that's every morning you do those? Yeah, now. that's every morning for an hour at 8 to 9, and every morning at 10 to 11, it's Kodachromes. How many residents would attend those? There's eight and all those, the Spanish, <laughs> about 
10 or 15 every morning. And it's okay. It gets a little too much for our regular residents that we pay. Uh -huh. The Spanish, of course, are all freebies for the summer. <laughs> and uh, a lot of other guests come in or some other guests come in. It's a, it's a pretty good way of teaching, but then I ad lib the stuff that they should know about these about these things. Here's mineralization in the lung. And yeah. I'd expect them to know that it's hypercalcemia, malignancy, vitamin, high vitamin D, low vitamin A, stuff like this. They should know that. Mm -hmm. And they'll get it. And if they don't take notes, they're the one, that's how I find are the, are the ones that um, don't do the best are those who don't take notes. If you just said lung, mineralization, uremia, I mean, uh, or hypercalcemia of malignancy or something like that, you know, which you wrote up, thank you so well, because it's really proved a boon in our place. Oh, know? has it? Oh, it's a good thing that you uh, picked that up, because I had seen it, I never recognized it, I had seen it, and I never gave it a name. Well, you know, in cattle with Yoni's disease, you'll see that mineralization sometimes up in the aorta? In the aorta, thank goodness. We had a buffalo last week, and it was probably Elizabeth's case again, but it could have been anybody's. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And darn, it didn't have good lesions anywhere. No good lesions anywhere. But it had a history of two months diarrhea. But no lesions of Yoni's. That's okay, so you don't see them. No lymphatic lymphangitis, no dilated lymphatics. Um, you couldn't say Yoni's. Except when you get to the aorta, you know, posterior aorta, you know, about, usually behind the diaphragm or sometime in front. Mm -hmm. Beautiful mineralization, just like any cow with yonis. And just because we did the cow, the bison last week, I didn't see the acid fast yet, but I bet it's there. Mm -hmm. Thank goodness. I you sense know. I know the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyways. Oh, I, why does it have that mineralization? What's that say? Ask God. Yeah. We all ask God. Just figured I'd check in case there was. No, it hasn't changed. Ask God. <laughs> And I don't like really doing that too much because I'm too close to, <laughs> to asking him pers <laughs> in person <laughs> compared yeah. to a young whippersnapper like you. I suspect you'll straighten him out with some things as well, knowing ah. you. <laughs> uh, geez, we've covered a lot of territory uh, here. We started way back when in uh, vet school and oh. classmates, and now we've... Uh, Yes. Fast that, forwarded. So you, let's uh, finish this for the first 50 minutes. Okay. The, the, uh, after the vet school, it was... Yeah, after the vet school, when the fellow said that, well, you're, uh, <clears throat> you're the best student in the class, or one of the best students in the class, I don't think you would have said the best, uh, your, your attitude has to change. Mm -hmm. But anyhow, I go to Cornell, and gee, it's a nice school. Jubb had just left, so I replaced Jubb at Cornell. And uh, Pansera was still used to staying up all night every night. Uh, doing so he was at Cornell. He was at Cornell. So I took Jubb's place. Carmichael was upset because Carmichael went to Cornell thinking he was going to work with Olison, but then he went on to Carmichael virus, herpes one, and mm -hmm. now the petite virus, uh, herpes of puppies and stuff. And he's just retiring this year, yeah. And uh, so then I got in there with Olofsson, McEntee, and Rickard, and Benting Smith. Ernie Biberstein was there uh, taking care of Benting Smith's job for a, a year while John was on sabbatical. Mm -hmm. And John and McEntee, uh, Ken McEntee both come back every summer to Cornell and stay around. But with, uh, I would always take specimens and uh, I would, take this wheelbarrow, honestly the wheelbarrow, from the, uh, from the necropsy room and I'd take it over to Fox's class and Roberts's class mm -hmm. and Finch's class. They all wanted me to bring the guts over to show the, the students. So I'd bring the buck and they would let me w just walk in the door. Uh, wheel it down the hallway. Wheel it down the hallway. It w didn't leak. Uh, and I'd go over to the old, down at the old vet school, because we were down on lower campus when I first got there in 55. We didn't move up to the new building until 57. And now just this year, uh, 40, 39 years later, we've now moved to the new, newer hospital. 
path is still in the old path location? still stand in the old place. It's going to be remodeled and modernized. I don't think they need it. I think all they need is somebody out there who's interested, keenly interested in necropsies. You don't have to worry about the buildings. Mm -hmm. And uh, one more minute, is that it? Five. Oh, five, okay. Mm -hmm. And then uh, I'd wheel them over there to, uh, to the different classes and just show them what yes, these cases were. And then Fox or Fincher, Roberts, whoever would, Hillman even, because uh, he was a resident. He must have been a student. Yeah. Oh, a resident. Yeah. Uh, he graduated in 55, too, I think. Anyhow, mm -hmm. he's retired. I think they're all telling me. Actually, my job, <laughs> you, my job you know, is already uh, advertised. And uh, the chairman came and he said, John, it's not that we want you to go, but it's already being advertised, and I haven't even said I'm going to retire. So that's kind of cute, too. Anyhow, I would show the wheelbarrow of stuff to him, and then I'd bring it, I'd bring it back and meet. I'd just turn around, come back. And then Fox would go and tell the students, well, you know, that was a case you all saw yesterday or mm -hmm. three days ago with so, such and such. Then I'd bring this stuff to Olofsson, or, because Olofsson was kind of a, the, of a little different school. He wasn't out there for everything. He would expect me to bring stuff into him, or Roger Pansera. And, uh, and we did, because Roger and I had a good, good uh, association. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was willing to teach me uh, almost anything, and, and we, we did that. But Olison, every time I had a good specimen, I'd usually show it to McIndy, Rickert, and Olison, because they're all right around. And uh, Olison last, and he said, what did McIndy say? <laughs> he said, well, what did Rickard say? Because he was always getting those two like this. And I would get different opinions sometimes, because I'm always showing him lesions. I'll tell you about some of them. I was going to say, that would be a good point to uh, pick up with after the uh, break. Fine. That'd be good. And get yes, in sir. with Olison. And I think we're hitting folks. the high points. I hope you're happy with my answers. Oh, I am. Yeah. So well, hope everybody I hope, out there uh, is. Everybody else out there is. I haven't insulted anybody too badly. <laughs> Can we take a break then? You had uh, started into some observations when you were with Olison and Pansiera and then playing Rickert and McEntee against these. Pick up with uh, that and tell us more about those days. Uh, it was pretty, let's see how to say it the best. It was, all, it was always, I think it was always confrontational. Nobody, uh, nobody was just willing to accept what anybody said and we, uh, it was great to ask them and get these different opinions for guys like me. Now you had to be careful, or I had to be careful, that I always introduced what I thought first. The main reason is, then they know what I think, and I'm not a yes man to them. Because whatever I thought when I first brought it into them, like I remember walking to Charlie Rickard one time when he became the associate dean. Because of all the people, I'm sorry to say this, I hope I'm not hurting anybody's feelings, uh, but of all the people who have died in my life, you know, they've, they've met their time. Mm -hmm. But I feel sorriest that Dr. Rickard died, and he's the only one who has died that I would love to welcome back, because he meant that much to me. He was such a wonderful teacher in, in mm -hmm. a man in every way. Uh, Olofsson, too, was, was nice, but he was a grand old man, and he had passed, uh, but I miss Rickard. He just died a little too darn early. Uh, and I'm, I'm so sorry for that. Was he kinder? Oh, he was always kind to everybody. Mm -hmm. But I remember bringing this, the first cases that I think had been described. Although uh, Wayne Crowell at Georgia, mm -hmm. several years later, gave me some cases uh, that, that he had. Uh, but the, these cases were uh, kidneys from a pig that had chronic diarrhea. And darned if it didn't have, when I brought it down to Charlie on a tray, I said, Charlie, because he's about the only guy I'd, I'd never call Peter Olofsson, Peter. Mm -hmm. But Charlie Rickett, I, I'd say Charlie. He said, what do you think of these? These are thrombi in the renal veins. Now, how do you think they got there? And he said something in effect, oh, well, um, mm, 
And I said, remember, they're in the veins. And then he kept looking and kept working. And then he said, well, embolized, embolized, embolization. I said, no, no, Charlie. I said, uh, in the veins. And how do you explain those? Well, ordinarily, he never made mistakes like that. I mean, because mm -hmm. he, and I, and I never knew when the heck he studied, because he was hardly ever in the postmortem room. I mean, he'd come out if I asked him, you know, when the year Pinscher and I, Pinscher and I were on together after Jub had left and we were alone. We'd stay there till 1 and 2 in the morning every night. And actually, for all you young people listening, I don't think it's worth it to hurt your family that much. Maybe I benefited my family by not being home <laughs> and giving the kids heck <laughs> about something. Because uh, I have a, well, he's 42 years old now, but he and I build houses on the side at night and weekends. But that's on the side. It's something to do that we're not all in pathology all the time. You have a good relationship with him? When he was growing up, I was in the postmortem room till 2 o'clock in the morning reading slides. So in the last four years, we build houses at night and weekends. And we have a blast. We can tell each other the nastiest jokes. We can we stop and have coffee any time we want to. Uh, I'm kind of the bank. because. Mm -hmm. uh, he works at a, he went to Cornell uh, Hotel School, but uh, he learned business, and that's wonderful. But he's a nice guy. He'll give you the shirt off. Oh, Don Mune, how about a beer, Don, you know? <laughs> and he will, he's a nice guy. I'm not. I won't do that. I, I never had money as a kid. I never had money until I got in the Army, hundred, you know, I made, what, $50 a month or whatever it was you made. Mm -hmm. Man, that was a gold mine. So that's why I like the Army. Mm -hmm. But... Until recently, I never had extra bucks that I could, you know, spend for beer for everybody, around for everybody. I mean, that would be so foreign. I don't drink anyhow, but it's so foreign to me, so I wouldn't have done that. But he does. Now, I didn't, he doesn't have that much money either because he works at the hotel when he's not building houses with me because he wants to be an Ithaca slumlord, <laughs> and that's kind of cute. But we work together. We have a good time. Good. But don't stay in a postmortem room. Uh, quite as much as we did. I don't know why we did. I mean, maybe it was Jubb who lived in a postmortem room, and then Pansera, and then King. Incidentally, we've been talking a little bit off stage and all about the young people, young residents, mm -hmm. as being, you know, they're not driven like we are. You might kind of believe it, I might kind of believe it, but maybe there's some doubt in even our minds, because there's some guy a number of years ago who said, the young people, they don't want to work too hard. They want to know what's in it for them, how much time off they get. Uh, they have no re really respect for their elders. You know that little veterinary student who told me to mm -hmm. do something, you know? Stuff it. Yeah, politely. And uh, she asked permission, though. But uh, things like this, uh, th this, this person years ago said that, and that, you know, the, the kids aren't up to snuff. But that was Socrates about 3200 BC. So maybe it's as we get older we feel this about the young people. And maybe there's a little more hope for them than, than what you and I have. Now you're saying, that darn king, he's mellowing too much. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. I know you're thinking that. <laughs> well, maybe so, but heck, I don't want to go see the chairman, the dean, and the president again. I better be careful. Uh, let's see. Yeah, where were we? Yeah, it was oh the hours in the postmortem room and yeah, I'm yeah, not don't sure I do that. I would do that again. I don't recommend that for other people. Uh, but you need somebody who's critical of everything you do, and I'm critical of everything the residents do. And I love to sit down with a scope with them because I read. I used to read over half of the slides and do more than half the case. I'm getting out of that a little bit. And you take any student trained in Europe, for instance, if they culture an organism, what killed that cow? That organism. And that's absolutely bonkers. Mm -hmm. It's the only organism that'll grow under the medial, the media conditions, their change of venue from the carcass to the petri dish, and therefore, oh, that's causative. You know, I think that's full of beans. Uh, if it looks yeah. like it's a good uh, fibrinous pneumonia, don't tell me you cultured E. coli out of it or actinomyces or something. That's baloney.
And I really still think it is. And then somebody say, wow, that's all we cultured. I said, sure, because when the animal's sick for five days, you pop them with antibiotics. And it might stop the growth of that organism in a Petri dish, but not in a carcass or something, whatever. Mm -hmm. And that's a, that's, a mis that's a mistake. So I like to, you know, always make them all think of what they're, uh, what they're doing. You know, you told the residents uh, today not to do that. If you're going to tell the residents today that wanted to enter a career in uh, veterinary pathology or the DVM student wanted to enter a career in veterinary pathology, what would be the one piece of advice you would give them? Uh, hmm. Give me a hint. I need, I don't know what I would tell them. I think there's no better, uh, well, actually I, I do have a problem with that because we have several experts at our school who sees the animals alive, for instance on eyeballs, we, who see the animals alive with central nervous CNS diseases, who sees them with skin diseases, and then they also follow them into the necropsy room or certainly biopsy stuff. And they get the whole picture, whereas you and I, as general diagnostics, in general diagnostics, um, we don't get the whole picture. And we can't follow it as deeply as those fellas can because we don't see it ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Well, in some things, certainly. But not, uh, I would, th maybe I would go into a specialty if it was me. Because I feel that many schools, uh, I consider veterinary pathology or, yeah, veterinary pathology kind of as a circle. Maybe like this little, uh, little platform we're on. It's nice and round. Well, that edge of the platform is 85% of what is known of any one subject. And any of these radials going off, they represent a subject. John King, I can probably take 85%. I can go from the middle all the way out. I know 85% of the stuff coming through the door without history and stuff like that. I can recognize the lesions on 85%. Panciera, kind of my mentor, Rickard or McEntee, they're all a little bit smarter than I am. Uh, they'll get 87% individually, 87%. I will know a 2% difference that Roger doesn't know or Roger, you know, stuff like that. So I can add, if Roger hired me at Oklahoma, I could go to Oklahoma and add up to 89% because he knows 87, being a little smarter, mm -hmm. I can add 2% that he doesn't know about, up to 89%. And CNS, you get a guy like Della Hunter, who's kind of a genius in his CNS, he can take care of 85% of every neuro case that comes in. Uh, that's what makes the schools better, I think. Then uh, David Dodd, he's another 85 or 87% in general diagnostics. You, you think it would be a better school with King, Pantera, and Dodd? I don't think so. What would be better school would have any one of the, the three guys, maybe King's the lowest, that's okay. I'm not proud. Uh, and then you'd have a guy who's 85% skin, 85% brain, 85% ovaries and testicles if you were going to reproduction, 85% in muscles like Cooper. I don't care for Cooper at all, personally. Uh, but I respect his brains because he's really sharp. And uh, We started together out on the necropsy floor. You and he? Yeah. Oh, because I remember telling him off then, even then, but <laughs> he's faculty <laughs> now, so i got to behave myself. But it's, uh, he'll enjoy hearing the fact at least he made it out of the Oh, he'll never tape. hear this, I hope. But, no, he is smart. But most of the Australians are, for instance, or the British because they come off the top of the heap academically to get into their veterinary schools. Whereas you and I, we had to compete with the other farm kids who were, who were interested in being a veterinarian and had a fair grade. They weren't dodos, but, because, uh, well, I was a farm kid too. So I had to compete with other young men, you know. Did you ever get tired of Coop's tick paralysis stories? I got tired of Coop early on, and I probably didn't, if he's given a seminar now, I probably wouldn't attend it, unless he's talking on muscles. I mean, if he's going to, because he's he that do, good. He's oh, he's that good. Yes. Yeah. And his wife is good on the muscles too. Mm -hmm. But all that—that's what the schools need. They need more experts 
uh, and you don't need depth in these other things. If you have a good diagnostic diagnostician, you don't need the others. However, who can afford the others? <laughs> Unless you have a clinician who's really interested in CNS, he sees them clinically and then he follows the cases. And that, that's wonderful. So maybe the pathologist should do that. Because there's not much respect for general diagnostic pathologists anymore. Though they all give me lip service, oh yeah, you can do that. But I'm not sure you get the respect and thus the bucks and thus the uh, whatever, mm -hmm. prestige or something like that. But I'm not doing too bad because you know, I've got a sabbatical coming up and I'm going every place I want to. Everybody wants me because I'm willing to, I don't insult too many people if you, I go places. You're widely traveled. Just about everywhere except Russia. Mm -hmm. hmm. And I enjoy it and I've learned because all I do when I go anywhere really is um, I do the autopsies in the morning or for three or four hours or I give Kodachromes three or four hours a day. And uh, I show the Kodachrome and I discuss it. That's what I'm down here for too in a sense. And they like that because I will introduce the other p person's opinion even if I don't agree with it. But like the world says, well gee whiz, you know, when you have pulpy kidneys, what makes the uh, kidney pulpy? Well, they say neurotoxemia. I said, no, 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 this is a cow. I just gave glucose to last night and she died during the night. Why? Well, the glucose is in there acting as substrate. This is pathology, pure, not historical, although I've seen it all my life. I, I showed it to Olison and he said, well, that's neurotoxemia. I said, boss, this is a foal. And it was just given glucose and it died, you know, shortly after. And then we didn't post it for six hours. The glucose acted as substrate to cause the autolysis of the whole kidney. It looks like mush, except mm -hmm. the medulla. The medulla looks perfect. And histologically, that's what you see the same way. So it's really the glucose. Now, an enterotoxemia of sheep, that's why you put a dipstick in the urine, because, you know, you find the sugar. But that's what makes the kidney early, rapid, uh, enhanced autolysis. So it's kind of fun. And talking to the old guys, you show them the same thing and uh, with black leg, all the new things like 30 day postpartum black leg of the, of the perineum, you know, and you wonder, well, gee, 30 days postpartum. Well, these are new and different things. You, but it's taken a long time to see these things. And if you're not in the postmortem room with a good caseload, you're not gonna see these things. Mm -hmm. And you need somebody to put all the pieces of that pie together. Who is there is all the time doing it, and that's why it's worthwhile. But, uh, so you need a generalist, absolutely. But you don't need three of them. You, you need two of them, because mm -hmm. one of you gotta take a break, but you don't need three of them. And I know some schools have hired one good general diagnostic pathologist, or they've got one, they get another one, they get another one. They don't, they don't complement each other very well because you know you pass the boards incidentally the boards are the minimal requirement for a, a diag for a pathologist absolute minimal because many of them and I use the AFIP a little bit as an example many of them they all pass the boards and they do a darn good job at it yeah. they're very organized uh, and they do a very good job at it but if I got some of them in the postmortem room, including my host mm -hmm. uh, today, if I got him in the postmortem room and asked him what these things were without a square frame around them, I'd make him sweat a little bit more than he thought he would sweat. He even made us all sweat. Yeah, and, but that's, and it's fun. Mm -hmm. But it takes a lot of time, and if I'm not out there to collect these specimens, every senior will have hamburgered that liver or that that kidney. We were talking about that, uh, yeah, a minute ago we were talking about the uh, renal vein thrombosis with Charlie yeah. Rickard. Well, he had never seen that before. Nobody else had, except in humans you see it, anybody who has multiple uh, or exceptional electrolyte therapy or diarrhea. So you see it in children and old people. A lot of electrolytes, old people, children with diarrhea. Well, these pigs all had diarrhea. Now mm. we see it mostly in cows because they're getting fluids out the gazoo and we'll see it in them. With abomasal displacements or it doesn't matter? Or anything or? like, no, whatever they're getting lots of fluids with. Yeah. Now this is renal vein thrombosis. 
uh, with the abomasal displacement, you get a new lesion. Mm -hmm. And without thinking about it, without having just off the uh, just off the top of your hat, I have massive thrombi in the heat portal. Of, no, I have yeah massive thrombi in the uh, uh, port, hepatic portal veins. You know, I mean, in the liver themselves, in the liver itself, not in the portal vein down at the intestine. Why do they have those? Not many people describe them, and they make they don't make good infarcts in the liver, although they're thrombi. Why not? Well, because these are from displaced abomasum, and during displacement you get stagnation thrombi or something, whatever. And then you replace that displacement, and they become free, and they right up to the liver. So you now have nice lesions there. Mm -hmm. But if you're not thinking about it, and this is why if people want to do what I do as a general diagnostic pathologist, you have to do a lot of autopsies. You can't say I'm on duty. I'm sharing necropsy load with 12 other pathologists because that's pure bonkers. You're not learning a lick if you do that because you only get one twelfth of the cases and the other one twelfth you're doing, the other eleven twelfth twelfths you're forgetting and that one twelfth you saw. Actually you go backwards. So you have to do it all of the time. And uh, Any idea how many cases you've seen over the years? Have you ever tried to tally it somehow? Or? Well, 120,000. <laughs> Actually, if you consider, I have the largest private collection of codicombs in the world. I'll bet you I almost have as many as the AFIP has. <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> but our host, you better be careful. Yeah. But no, and I can find any one of them in 20 seconds or right now. If you ask me if That's why they want your collection then. Yeah. I can do that in 20, in 20 seconds. Now, if you want distemper, I have to go to the brain. I, all every now and then I have cases for you pathologists. Uh, start getting them organized early, because if you don't, you're going to have a heck of a time later. But you'll... I got codochromes all over the office. Mm -hmm. Mine are filed, and they're, I can find any one of them pretty quickly. Because What's the filing system? The boxes on the Briefly. shelf. Briefly. Briefly, the boxes on the shelf say abomasum. So don't, don't look anyplace else, they're all in the abomasum. And uh, if they're yellow, it's a horse. If it's blue, it's a, a cow. If it's white, it's sheep. So all these folders are all labeled like that. And now, if I have 12 folders abomasum that are all colored, well, it can't be, uh, can't be orange or yellow because horses yeah. don't have an abomasum, but They'll edit that but out. I would see it there, and then I go down through, do I, you want a parasite? And I'll have, you know, the 20 codochrome holders or diapositives, if you're Spanish, holders, there'll be 20 folders in there, and only two of them will have parasites, Shh, parasites. I've got two folders, 40 codochromes, and there's all the parasites of the rumen, you know, like uh, gondolinema mm -hmm. they're in rumen instead of the esophagus, or, or, uh, uh, grubs in the back, you know. So I can pull them out. I've got them right there. And if you're talking about uh, ruminal drinkers, I just go to metabolism. And it's got, it would be cows, so they'd be blue or whatever the color is for cows. And they're all the same through all those boxes. So I got a box for the ovaries and the testicles and four boxes on the liver. I don't think Bud Tennant could ever retrieve his codochromes that quickly. No, it's kind of, it's a, uh, you got to learn that too. Yeah. When you go to these countries, mm -hmm. do these courses and the necropsies and so forth, is it all in English? Not, now it's in Spanish, but what good, what, what's the good about English is half of what we teach and what half of what you know, if I said oligo, what would you think of, you know? Mm -hmm. And if I said, uh, 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 hyper, what would you think of, and all that stuff. So that's Greek and Latin. You and I are absolutely lucky that we know Greek and Latin as far as medical terms go. We don't have to speak it. That's a dead language that went out, you know, uh, mm -hmm. without, and so half the language we use, it's universal. So there's 50% of, so you now, I, already, in Spanish? I already know English, not too well, a lot of people say poorly, but anyhow, I know English, and then now I just have to learn a few Spanish words. And all you, and remember, as a teacher down there, down there or in Spain, you ask questions. 
donde esta la legiones, las legiones. I have to get an article fits with the noun, you know. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you say, donde esta, well that is where is, good. And you've got, or cuando, when. And you learn some of these good ones like that. But I can go through and uh, in Spain they say eat a go and someplace else they say a little bit different for the liver and, and pulmones and stuff like that. The other day it was even interesting. Mm -hmm. I'm writing a report or I'm correcting a report and I said animals, A-N-I-M-A-L-E-S. But then I'm thinking, that's wrong. Why is that wrong? And I can't think why, because I'm studying Spanish <laughs> to go for the sabbatical in You're South right. America. There's no E in anim in it's animales for Spanish, you know. So I'm making mistakes in my English. Favorite country? South Africa. Because everything you want to do, uh, everything you want to study in South Africa, for instance, uh, virology, parasitology, toxicology, it's all on unders the port. When I was down there in 75, 76, part of my sabbatical uh, system, sabbaticals are great. Everybody should use them, even if you don't. Now, a lot of people take advantage of them, go goof off. Uh, we have faculty to do, do that. But if you don't go someplace else, uh, you're not doing your profession well or yourself well. Now, if you've got three kids and you've got to haul them with you mm -hmm. when you're young, Professor, that that's a little tough. I understand that. Uh, but South Africa, apartheid was real there. It's not there now. So, uh, but I enjoyed that country because it looks more like ours. So therefore, I'm no, and they spoke English, thank goodness, mm -hmm. and Afrikaans. But uh, so that was nice, and they had very very competent people. Inbred, yes, because I don't know why, but. Uh, they're very sharp and all those veterinary students come off the top of the heap academically too, just like the other English or some other countries. Mm -hmm. But I, I like that the best. Um, See heart water? Oh, out the gazoo. Is that yes, right? Yes, sir. Heart water out the gazoo. Uh, Caudria, I learned to make smears, how they do it. And they were willingly, there was a guy named Pinar there and Kuz Ketza who was here, I guess, at the FIP. They've just got a book out, or Coos has, uh, uh, on infectious diseases of South Animal in South Africa. Mm -hmm. Fabulous book, beautiful pictures, well done. Um, now I would, I would go back there to study because you don't come to Cornell for beef cows. I don't think I'd go to North Carolina for, for um, beef cows. Be oh, mm -hmm. yeah. Well, see, and, and uh, for parasites, well, you have more than we have. It's too cold in New York for a parasite to live over, you know. <laughs> yeah. So we don't have that many problems. Every now and then we get an import, and he's loaded from North Carolina or some other place. What other good diseases from South Africa that you enjoyed? Or some people? Or hairy the, incidences? The wildlife down there is great. They do a lot of that. And they were willing to share everything with me. And every morning, Pina uh, or Coos or something, we would, because uh, I, uh, I would give two hours of Kodachromes and he would give two hours of Kodachromes. And that was the most educational thing. And I've done that even in, when I was in Australia, I did that. Uh, I was there for a year and you, you share your Kodachromes. They'll, They'll let you copy anything. I let them copy all mine, whatever. Mm -hmm. It was a very good give and take. I had a very poor time in, in Switzerland, and I think it's the culture. It's a really a culture shock to go to Switzerland. It was probably my fault, but remember many countries, European or foreign countries, the pro professors aren't used to being questioned critically. And I know, remember one professor went, a friend of mine, went to Oklahoma to be on a faculty and, and uh, my classmate was, uh, Louis Stratton was on a faculty. And this guy went there for the job interview uh, and he got the job. 
but they were interviewing some other people. I forgot which was first. Then he was on a committee to interview other new, new members, uh, potential faculty. And he jumped one of the speakers. I shouldn't play with that. Uh, he jumped one of the speakers uh, pretty badly because the fellow used pathological terms. He wasn't a pathologist. He was going to be something else. I don't know what. And he jumped all over him in a way. And everybody in the audience was a uh, amazed that here's one of their faculty jumping this speaker. I thought it was wonderful. I wasn't there. But I thought to hear him, well, he jumped all over him. And I says, well, of course he did. The guy was, he was a jerk. And he should have been jumped on. They hired him anyhow. And that was bad. They hired him anyhow, I guess. And it uh, didn't turn out so well. But my classmate said, well, he had no right. I said, yeah, but the guy's saying something wrong. I mean, well, why shouldn't he be knocked for that? And uh, that's why I guess a lot of people don't come to Cornell without, you know, a lot of protection somehow because they're going to get blasted <laughs> by everybody, I think. And maybe it's, you don't have to be too bad hard, but that's life. Because I get blasted any time I say something wrong, and I'm quick to blast back. Mm -hmm. How about... Uh Taiwan and your book and Dr. Lee? Lee's, Lee, uh, I first met him as a graduate student at Cornell in the early, in the late 50s. His brother was a uh, Nobel Prize winner in hmm. physics or something like that. And Bob was a... Uh, I should say one of your books. That's okay. Uh, um, and Bob himself, Bob Lee, C.T. Lee, he was a minister without portfolio. He was a... Uh, um, like the Minister of the Interior, oh. what's that, Secretary of the Interior, something uh -huh. for Taiwan. And he did a fabulous job getting everybody to Taiwan to teach. And he asked me to go, and again, I just showed Kodachromes. Now, they don't have many cows, and they don't have one or two horses, and, but the rest, they have a lot of pigs, so I learned a lot about pig path. Mm -hmm. and, uh, but he made the opportunity available for many Americans everywhere and also for the Chinese themselves to come to America. And that worked uh, very well. It's fun to teach the Chinese, except there's a little bit of a problem with it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Yes. Uh, they'll say yes and smile. And that's disconcerting because you think they do understand. But if you ask them a little bit of a question, they might not Don't have know. learned it. And that's kind of embarrassing for me and them because I thought they all understood it when they said yes because they don't want to uh, insult anybody. And when I told them, I told a couple of them after I showed them a heart anomaly or the single most common, common heart anomalies of all animals put together is the incomplete subiotic stenotic ring. So you tell them that. Do the most common anomaly? the most common heart anomaly of all animals put together, Dr. Mutin, is the incomplete subiotic stenotic ring, and don't you forget it. And if you don't take notes on that, you're going to forget it because you forgot it last time. That's right. I better write that one. Dang I thought that right. was a new one, much less that it's the most common. It's by far the most common one. And anyhow, you tell them that, and you're the only one here, and your other classmates in Taiwan are doing something else. And I said, make sure you tell them. Next morning, I asked Dr. Lee or another Lee or w mm -hmm. whatever, hey, what did you think of that heart anomaly yesterday, <laughs> that most common one? What heart, anomal heart an what heart anomaly? And you didn't tell them. Then I say you, well, why didn't you tell them? And you'll smile at me, but I won't get an answer out of you. I could strangle you. And I guess it's because of the higher, one of them said it was a hierarchy. They have a lot of people over there, and there's only room for a few at the top. And if I don't tell you, now, I don't know if that's how they think mm -hmm. or if it's just natural or something. What is this incomplete subaortic ring? It doesn't cause megasophagus? It's no, it's, it, it's the single most common heart anomaly that's not clinically evident in most cases. There's nothing, so you will overlook it. And that's what I've done over the years. Yeah, because it is in all species. It's yeah. in cows. It's just, it looks like a start of a, you know, a stenotic ring. Mm -hmm. But it just only goes that far. 
or it only goes one dot size, but it's right underneath the aorta, maybe what animal it is. You know, just I need some photos of that. Yeah. Are they in that last batch you sent me? And by the way, thanks. Oh. No, I don't know where I'd put that, but it's 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 just a little thing to talk about. Then the interesting thing is another. It's another thing in respect. Uh, several people at Cornell wrote a book, and they wrote a book on anomalies. And the catch on that is, did they come to anybody in the pathology department and ask them about what the common heart anomalies are or something? No. And that bugged me a little bit. So mm -hmm. I don't know anything. Well, maybe I don't know much in great detail because we have all these experts. And why should I go look up something on the CNS system when Dullahunter knows all of them just at the top of his anywhere? Yeah. And he knows them in great detail. I can only get down about three, three notches of information, whereas he would be very good. And I love those guys, but it, it does take a little bit away from me in the sense that I don't take the time to do that because he's there. And if they've got Scott on the skin, but yeah. it, it makes our place a little bit stronger in many ways because we have these extra experts. And uh, when I do finally think of retiring, because I got into the system when I don't have to retire, I can go like this till I'm about 105. <laughs> I don't have to retire. I hope you keep doing it. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Cornell's been blessed with some excellent people over the years. They've written a lot of the books, and we've got some new ones coming along doing the same thing. I mean, we're glad to have Scott with his 85% skin, probably 90% skin, and Delahunter yeah. with all his brains, and Reese with his eyeballs, and Schlafer with his ovaries and testicles, and Cooper again with his muscles, you know. Mm -hmm. and, so it's neat to have that. Uh, but the clinicians are affording a lot of that because Scott's a clinician, Miller's a clinician, Reese is a clinician doing histopathology and growth. Yeah. So that's pretty nice. So it makes our system good. But if they don't have somebody like me in the postmortem room, kind of cock of the walk, because you don't come in there and walk over me. And if you try <laughs> to, I will walk over to the clinics and find you and tell you about it. And if you send over a rotten dog that you've done $400 worth of clinical biochemistry and you send it over uh, on Friday night and w we get the re request for necropsy on Monday, what a waste. Yes. And I don't allow that to happen without a little bit of kick, and I write it on the report. The clinicians lose their cool, but we don't send the reports to the owners. They go to the vet, mm -hmm. the clinician or something, because we're not. And if they want, if they come back with a l little bit of apology, I might change the report and, you know, wipe out all the little notes I put in the bottom. It's just a shame that the owner did not want to share this dog with everybody after doing all this work on it. And <laughs> somebody gets the hint, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. You think the clinicians have a little too much say and a little too much power at the uh, veterinary colleges now? Well, with our new curriculum, they only have an uh, crack at the students for maybe a year, a year and a half, and that's it. All the rest of it is done by big committee, of which many of them are not veterinarians, and that's the shame, because you don't have the veterinarians doing that. Now, some of the veterinarians like that, but uh, because, you know, it gave them less work, but I don't think it's good for the students or the profession. And we already talked that a little bit. I don't know how that's going to last, but I don't think it'll work. Yeah. Well, and the Cornell system now is just so drastically different from any other curriculum that mm -hmm. there's uh, yeah. in the country. How about Olison? Tell us some more things about him, and, and in particular, and I assume it's uh, him, but it may, it may be the wrong answer. Who influenced you the most in vet for veterinary pathology? Uh, well, Pansiera, because he was there every day. And, uh, but some of the young people, Surprisingly, yourself, the fact that you picked up on the hypercalcemia malignancy, that's pretty neat. And mm -hmm. Some fellows, like everybody here knows, John Edwards. Yeah. As my, as my protege, protege in a way, I really don't think you are. You guys made yourself. And I like to think of when I teach, I want to teach somebody for 
two years, three years, whatever, and make them self-perpetuating pathologists. They know lots of the answers, not all of them, but they know how to do the post and think more than just uh, superficially. And I think I'm proud of many of them. Hoschek, you know, and yourself, mm -hmm. and Edwards. You guys don't need somebody like me anymore. You can think deeper. Uh, but there's a lot of others who have never done that. I don't think they did enough autopsies. And I think enough autopsies are very important. Uh, and when you share them with 11 other residents, I don't think you're getting enough. Unless somebody is there and they force a show and tell. And if you're a reticent pathologist, because we have some at school who have been there eight or nine years and they're still trying to take their boards. They told me off long ago, so I haven't talked to them since. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can take a hint. You don't want to talk to me because you don't like my questions? Sorry, I, I don't know how to do any better. But I have a guilty feeling about that a little bit. Because if you upset the people too much that they don't want to learn from you, you've lost a little bit. And that really bothers me a little bit. Not enough to change. Mm -hmm. And I'll be sorry to when I go see the big guy up there or something like that, or down there, I don't know which. Uh, I wished, I guess that's a few places where I'm sorry, that I irritated some people so badly by my, but then I wasn't willing to change. And they didn't come and say, hey, let's, let's uh, bury the hatchet or something and let's all learn together or something. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't willing to change. So. I do feel sorry for that. Did you start? The show and tells at Cornell, or were they? Yes. That, that's that's okay. Uh, they learned other ways, but Olson didn't want me to do it first. But Fox and the others spoke to him and, and asked him to do it because he thought it was a wheelbarrow, all that. And it's all I had at first. <laughs> but then Roberts, I think it was Roberts, bought a big proper cart mm -hmm. that I could wheel around instead of a wheelbarrow. So they did a, he did a good, I think it was Roberts, yeah. And then eventually he just kept them in the necropsy lab and they came to you. Mm -hmm. And at first they all came. Now, I, Fox came, Hillman still comes, Mary Smith comes, Fox comes, and they see these things. And the young clinicians, so you get, say you graduated from Washington State, Missouri, or something like that, you're going to come in and let a young younger or older whippersnapper tell you that they're crazy about what they said about this big lung is full of air and, and congestion. Then well, that's pulmonary congestion and emphysema. And I say, no, the cow, her electrolytes were probably a little screwed up as she was dying and she was breathing hard <coughs> and she gets emphysema. So what? Next. But they don't like that uh, savoir faire or nonchalance or something, whatever you call it, mm -hmm. that I I tend to show on things of no significance. Mm -hmm. I feel it was lucky for me, at least, to have seen the uh, show and tells when Oleson could attend there. And it got to the point, though, that he, it seemed as if he had to trust your eyes. Oh, absolutely, because he couldn't see doodly squat in the last few years. But there was a period of about 10 years before I came back in 68, uh, well, eight years, that nobody asked him back. And that really hurt him, and oh, he yeah. felt bad about that. So when I asked him to come back, you know, we, he'd have to waddle in, and I'd tell him that, and then he'd give you the stories. Well, I don't have too many stories like he had, uh, I guess, because he got in on the beginning of many very important diseases, the things I show people, like yep. this incomplete heart anomaly, I mean incomplete subiotic uh, stenotic ring. If it's not clinically important, why worry about it? Except, as a general pathologist, you should know what it is. Core temperature gangrene. We've seen core temperature gangrene. Are you familiar with it? No, what's that? Uh, or at least by that name, I'm not. The way you're yeah. looking at me is, <laughs> I mean, either better what be What the or heck you don't know? Uh, it's, you know, you, you have a horse, it's lo a foal that's losing its, its hoof, yep. it's sloughed. And if they don't check all the other feet, they'll think, well, gee whiz, that he's sloughed his hoof, he hurt it, got an infection, and it's sloughing. But if they had checked all the temperature of the other four feet, F-O-U-R, you would find that all of them, he might be sloughing all of them, that one's the first one that fell. 
And this is due to, in my mind, like core temperature gangrene, is you get a high fever for whatever reason, and you're cold, even in the hot summertime. You're cold, you're cold, you shiver, you're cold, you got a high fever, you shiver, you're cold. And you'll get peripheral vasoconstriction so badly that all four feet will slough because you now have gangrene of those feet. All because it's like, I know all you people argue with me on this thing too, on ringtail. I've seen ringtail in thousands of rats when I worked for industry because we raised all the rats. I was the only veterinarian, the only pathologist there and stuff like that. And every day in cage that we saw, the cages were all wet. And the little rats were cold and they froze. And rats control their temperature when they're young by their tail, vascular. <laughs> and they'll constrict down. And, and pigs in the summertime that lose their tips of the ears. Somebody says, vegetative endocarditis. I said, baloney. That's due to infection, give them a fever, and then they get core temperature gangrene as a result. Now, you might thrombi up there, and, and then somebody says, oh, yeah, thrombi. I said, where do you think they came from? Oh, from the heart, if it's on the right side. But that's baloney, because you're then telling me the little piece broke off the left heart. It started up, it broke in two exact pieces. Both went up the external carotids or whatever, our internal carotids, mm -hmm. and then they divided up and went the auricular branch and both gangrene. That's, that's a story, man. That's not real. But there's no reason you can't get stagnation thrombi when you get core temperature gangrene. So that's something a little bit new and different I'm willing to argue about. And if you say I'm wrong, that's okay too, but I'm probably more right than you think I am. Before we get into the new and different lesions, yeah. Um, how about some of those that you'd have to take credit for either the discovery of or a significant part of the uh, identification of? Only because, like you did with your, uh, with your hypercalcemia malignancy, you saw that kind of stuff. And then you finally put it together. That's, that's what I did because you saw enough. You saw a lot. And that's what I have done with a lot of these things that are kind of new and different. I don't think it's um, all that that smart. Uh, well, pick some of them that you uh, originally 19, worked out. In 1940, you know, in 19, 19, uh, what the heck, oh, 63, I was doing an autopsy on a war veteran, a GI, at the VA hospital in Pittsburgh. And I get to his heart and I see these these areas of damage in the myocardium. I said, oh, hey, good. Look at this, man. Uh, what would you think when you get scattered areas of fibrosis in the heart? And if I asked you, you'd say, well, you had coronaries, mm -hmm. or something like that. Yeah. And uh, I'm saying, yeah, he's got coronaries, all right. Uh, I mean, he has coronary disease, maybe. Before that, what happened at at school with Olofsson, I had this sheep that had these fabulous lesions in the myocardium. Acute lesions, mineralization, uh, fatty change, mineralization, stuff like that. And then uh, I hauled all Olofsson out there and Rickard McInerney. I remember this, it was great. All three of them came out, looked, and they said, well, he's probably got white muscle disease, John. I said, well, maybe, but then look it, and he's an older sheep. And. Mm -hmm. uh, he had listeria. No mineral, just fibrosis. Well, he had mineral. It only takes 20 hours or less to get mineral. Mm -hmm. uh, one day we, in the old days, we ligated the uh, <clears throat> ureters on the dog, and uh, he couldn't get rid of anything. Uh, no, we took out the kidneys, actually, and they got mineralization in, the, oh, 20 hours, something like that. Anyhow, uh, that's when I used to be a research type. <laughs> so on this, uh, the sheep, it's got these multifocal, multifocal areas of degeneration of myocardium. All of a sudden, white muscle, no, it's an old sheep. And uh, we didn't know about exertional myopathy at that time, but it didn't matter. Mm -hmm. It wasn't that. And then he and Rick and McIntyre, they all agreed it could be white muscle for some reason. Lo and behold, it had listeria. So mm. this GI that would died, he had all these multifocal areas. And you know, I'm, I didn't believe anybody then either and I don't really know. And lo and behold, I said, but his coronaries are clear. Well, they healed. I said, yeah, give me his diet and we'll cure everybody in the world, you know. And uh, I said, no, he has something else wrong with him. Now remember, I'm doing these, even the people, 
and uh, at the VA hospital in Pittsburgh without histories. They're there, the MD's there, but he just let me mm -hmm. play, you know, and stuff like that. So I'm playing. Now you're a trainee or what? No, what I was just a visiting pathologist. Yeah. Happened to be a veterinary pathologist. And uh, so he said, oh no, that's got, he's got coronary disease. I said, does not. And he said, did you look? I said, well, how could I say he didn't? Because, <laughs> you know, I yeah. give him a little static. Uh, how could I say he didn't have it if I didn't look? And uh, then we let it go, except I says, you know, when I see it, usually they've had trauma to the head. And that guy had a steel plate in the whole side of his head from shrapnel during a war. And then when he died, shrapnel during a war, myocardial damage, brain heart syndrome or neurogenic cardiomyopathy. Wop to the head, spinal cord or major nerve plexi, and you'll get these myocardial changes. And if they're big enough, they'll leave scars. You know, 20 years later, well, I mean, a scar, what the heck? You can live with a scar, everybody does. And that was my first case there. So we kept proving that. They don't, the humans still don't accept that fully, which hmm. is their loss. But we see a lot of that. We see it with the kidney, gastric stomach, and nobody believed me. So the clinicians twisted the stomach on a dog, and yeah. now, they now they're believers. Mm -hmm. The core temperature is we're talking about. The clinician said, well, we think we have it. And they were absolutely on cloud nine. They got core temperature gangrene. I, said, I wanted to say, what the heck are you getting excited about? We've had it around for 20 years. You know, but I, I'm nice. I just, I wouldn't insult them like that. It took you a long time to sell the brain heart syndrome to the... Oh yeah. It'll take twice as long to sell core temperature. Except I have some of it in some of these books. Mm -hmm. They're not well uh, reviewed maybe. But some of us stood the test of time so I don't worry about it too much. And remember, I make the diagnosis usually without the history. Mm -hmm. And that's what pays off. You guys have some meerkats here. Yeah. You guys have some meerkats at picture someplace. Yeah. Just and uh, I had one in Switzerland. I said, hey, he's going to have a beautiful, uh, he's got a brain lesion. He had a beautiful brain lesion because he had that lesion in the heart. Stuff like that. So I don't mind fighting the system. And when you go in a heart, heart with hardware and a cow, yeah. you know, the piece of wire is going to be that long and about with a cook <laughs> in it like that, you know. Guess what? That cow in, they hadn't even opened the heart. They made the diagnosis because it was full of pus and junk. And they hadn't opened the heart. So I pulled it out of the barrel and I said, it, and I told all the students, it's going to be this long, and thank God. Because I'm not baloneying them, I'm serious in my pathology. And I happen to be right again, but do as many as I have, you'll be right. Do you still collect those? Put them in your Absolutely. notebook? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. It's one of the photographs I show the uh, students when I uh, teach that part. And there's the diff one of the major differences between you and I. I didn't take the time to save those over the years. You did because it makes an impact on the students when I say, now this notebook is full of these. And they are. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, that's fun, though. That's, uh, yeah. that's why I like it. Mm. But to have graduate students like you, I wouldn't do it if I didn't have graduate students. Pick one more in the closing two minutes that uh, you were a big part of or one that you want to talk about. Let's do that one for the last bit. Uh, the anesthetic gas machine lung. All these dogs that die pretty quick after anesthesia, for instance, and they lose all the oxygen. Uh, they're they're uh, uh, intubated with uh, anesthetic gas, which is metabolizable. And if for some reason they don't get air with 80% nitrogen in, the lung will tend, tend to collapse after when they're coming out of anesthesia or well, they're already out of anesthesia but if the bandages are too tight or something like that all that metabolizable gas will be absorbed and the lung will collapse more and more if they don't get bagged with air not oxygen air mm -hmm. the air with 80 percent nitrogen and then they'll die that's a very interesting uh, thing hmm. nice new entity what about the uh Geez, I feel like you're going to yell at me for this one. Atypical interstitial pneumonia. Well, it's so typical, it shouldn't have had that name. Who gave it atypical? I thought that was you. Job and Kennedy. Oh. Yeah. No, I, I always call it proliferative pneumonia because the only thing in the lung, the alveoli, that can respond are the epithelial cells. 
So it's a proliferation of alveolar lining cells, type 2. Because, you know, type 1 is a single nucleus here and cytoplasm going here, maybe another nucleus, a little cytoplasm. You hardly see the lining. And when I first worked on it with Habel, Habel was the first one to prove at Cornell mm -hmm. that there was a epithelial lining with the EM because it was the first EM pictures of it. Habel took that there is an L epithelial lining of each alveolus. Do you ever convince the clinicians to use atropine? Several. Bob Kenny at Penn, and that's the only thing that'll save them is atropine. But that was McIntyre's comment. He said, use that because we stop degranulation of the pituitary, this get a little complicated, yes. by giving them whopping doses of atropine, one gram. They kick at the belly, photophobic, yes, but they stop degranulation. But it also stopped secretion, and it'll save those cows with, you know, it dries your mouth or your trachea yeah. or whatever, and they live. Huh. Your name, you going to tell us who you are? Uh, in the, cl in the uh, very beginning of the tape, in the closing moments, we're going to put that stuff in because of the faux pas. But we'll get it in there. His name is Don. <laughs> and we'll take a break at this point, pick up for the uh, third good, session. Good show. In the, uh, for the last hour, let's make sure that we uh, talk about some of the uh, uh, people that either you knew or influenced you. And I know we've covered Olison and you've mentioned McEntee and Rickard and so forth. But who are some of the others that uh, you'd like to share with us? Uh, although they were my teachers, don't forget, we should not forget the pupils, so to speak, because they help make your life or uh, nice or miserable. And uh, so residents like yourself and all the others that you know that have been associated with me. But some of the others would be like Charlie Barron. He was one of the best men for pathology uh, and veterinary pathology. He was a, uh, a clear, erudite speaker. He knew what he was saying. He would question everybody and he and I were, um, were good friends uh, professionally. And I really respected that fellow. He wouldn't, uh, if, if you were giving a talk on primates, you better not say monkey when you're talking about a gorilla. And you darn well not talk about monkeys when you're playing with a slow lori either. Because he would, he would speak up in the middle of a thing and give you heck or correct you. And I thought that was darn good to put a, for the profession. I tried hmm. it a little bit, but I wasn't quite as smart as he was. So. If it dealt with something in the necropsy room, you know, I'd probably even give, him, even give him a little lip. But he was smart enough not to do that with me, I guess. But he was a wonderful man for the profession. Then, you know, the, the, what's, who, who is doing all, well, who is doing this, or why did it start? Uh, uh, C.L. Davis, Charlie Davis. I met him at Chicago. He and uh, at the meetings we used to go to and this whole thing, the AFI, the ACVP started uh, at the Continuing Education Center there, way out in the boonies from downtown Chicago. But it was a wonderful meeting. Uh, and I met him there. And one of the best things I ever learned from the fellow was uh, if it's green, it's uh, not TB. Because he he recalled that he had never seen a positive case of TB that was green pus. And I thought that was a, that's, that's held forth for almost 40 years with me. Uh, there's a little, little niche in that right now, or a little, little, um, it might not hold all of the time, but pretty mm -hmm. close. So i that would be one of my cliches that I would use in teaching. If it's green, it's green, it, it's not TB. Another good cliche like that would be, uh, if it ain't firm, it ain't pneumonia. And I'll, of course, I apologize, being a Cornell professor for my English, but you all got the point. If it ain't firm, it ain't pneumonia. Those are some John Kingisms. Uh, mm hmm. <laughs> and uh, like being full of, as a Christmas turkey, you know, or something like that, full of beans as a Christmas turkey. Uh, I don't use them quite as much as I used to because I don't know who's going to find fault with them. Uh, I mean, I'm not a beer drinker, so should I take, uh, sh so should I take uh, umbrage at somebody saying uh, um, beer, beer commercials or something like that, or 
being a, what is it, the Milwaukee Brewers? I mean, what do I care about beer? Why name them Brewers? You know, people are getting silly at what they get touchy about. Mm -hmm. So I don't want to do that. Um, but Charlie Davis and starting the Charlie foundation. Charlie Davis, yeah. Well, he didn't have anything to do with starting it except being the inspiration for it. Uh -huh. So the guy that we really should really think who has done more for continuing education in the world, now not at Cornell, not at Ohio, not at North Carolina, but in the world and in general in the United States would be Sam Thompson. I remember him. He was a kind of a martinet because he was in the Army, and these Army guys are all like that. You know, they learn how to salute, and they spend the rest of your life saluting. And I think some of them want you to even when they're out of the Army. And uh, so I josh with him about that. And I don't think we ever clicked our heels together. That was too Prussian for him, I guess. But I bet he would have appreciated it now and then. But <laughs> Sam has done so much for all of us. He made this available to you and I. Yeah. It's a nice little break from the stinking postmortem room if it's a hot sunny day wherever we are in the summer. Yes. And therefore he has done more than anybody. And uh, hmm. you might not like his way all the time because when this all started, the C.L. Davis started, I think for the first several years I gave seven out of the twelve talks and at first there was just a few uh, it, for each year, you know, every month they had a meeting in Sunset or what's that place in New Jersey? I already forgot it. Somerset. Somerset. Some, somewhere near there. Mm -hmm. And I would drive down from Cornell with half a dozen people or four people and uh, I'd give the talk for four hours or th I guess it was four hours. And I'd just show Kodachrome's four hours and say what I thought because these guys had never seen a lot of dogs and cats and cows and horse stuff. So I would do that. And I always enjoyed it. I didn't get paid for it. And uh, uh, I'm not even sure he paid, uh, he paid the expenses. But it didn't matter. In those days, we were doing it, and it was a good thing. Because mm -hmm. I was teaching my students. Because you know, I, what I showed down there in Somerset, I wouldn't show at Cornell or something like that. And that worked out very, that was very nice. Uh, then when he started out in Chicago, I went out there and gave maybe three or four a year out there, and he paid for all this, I mean, uh, for that trip, because that was, Cornell probably wouldn't want to do that, I didn't want to push my luck too hard. And I went out there and uh, did the same thing. So I think all of us, well, everybody, and then when uh, Charlie Barron died, all of his books were given to uh, Charlie Davis, I mean, to the foundation. Mm -hmm. And most of them were bound, Char Charlie Barron's were, and uh, Sam gave them to me to give to either Cornell or somebody else who wanted them. Well, gee, if he's that nice to give them to Cornell, Cornell doesn't need them because everybody who dies in New York shipping books to Cornell, you know. So they were all sent to Latvia. Now Cornell paid for the transportation, but there was thousands of dollars involved in just sending the darn things. And uh, C.L. Davis did go? Latvia and Lithuania. I can't remember if it's one or the other because it wasn't Estonia, but Estonia. Well, why was that? Or was they didn't ask, I guess. <laughs> so I only sent it to the people who asked. But Sam gave me all of the, all of the books, and they were bound. And uh, to, you know, the... Uh, American, I mean, the, the Vet Path Journal and all that, mm -hmm. they were all sent over there. So, and Sam's glad for that because there's no, no sense wasting them at Cornell. Hmm. Uh, let's see, who else? I don't know. Did oh. you work with any of those folks? Or, or was it mostly at meetings that Only you overlapped? Meetings, or? Yeah, I had much to do uh -huh. with them, yeah. Uh, Leon Saunders, yeah. I, oh, he has been, he is a perfectionist. He's a pain in the butt at times for that, but he's wonderful, mm -hmm. and uh, because he's so competent, I li uh, I liked him. At times I argue with him. I mean, not too much professionally, but he's a purist, and he's uh, he actually gave me heck within a month or two ago, because it took me 15 years to read the history of Russian 
the venom medicine of Russia. Well, I had a copy of the book. I don't know where it went, but I got another copy and I read it. And reading a lot of dry 42 letter names of, uh, you know, whatever, mm -hmm. it was kind of dry, so I forgot them. But it was a very interesting book because he's a fabulous writer, uh, Leon. And he's, you know, what the heck he was, he's almost 80 or something now, and he's no kid. So, uh, he's actually a fireball. Yeah, and he's a wonderful man, so you could learn from him. And he started the journal, you know, the, uh, mm -hmm. the ACVP journal. What did he think of your photos? Did he like your Kodachromes? I never heard him complain. Hmm. Uh, I don't know if everybody likes the blue background. Right. I do because there's nothing biologically blue except your eyes aren't. They're green, Yours jealous. are. Yours yeah. are blue. But there's not much, too much that's blue, so that's why I chose that background. And I didn't choose it arbitrarily. Uh, I took lots of pictures with black, red, green, whatever. And I asked many people what was the best background. And I got out of most of them that blue was the best for the things. Hmm. Others say, oh, no, black. Well, I don't know. I like blue. And I said, well, why not use it? I asked that question mostly because of his uh, perfectionist side yeah. and you were always big on just put the specimen down take a picture yeah because that's how we saw it and I didn't mind highlights I still don't mind highlights because that's how you see them um, but I remember arguing with him oh this is a great thing <laughs> out of Chicago we had the uh, he was always keen on eyes Leon Saunders and he was keen on eyes and he said uh, oh you have to do all this special fixation and all this stuff like that I said, uh-huh, because I did eyeballs. And sure, you have an artifact here and there, but I didn't worry about them too much. I mean, if it had inclusion bodies in some of those cells, it was distemper. There's no bodies. That's not hard to do. So what, anyhow, we also have eyeballs, and he told everybody how to cut the culottes and do it all properly. So I went down in Hus, and we had 12 pigs to autopsy. That means 24 eyeballs. And they're all killed quick. And I put them in acid... Uh, or booins and alcoholic uh, zinkers and formalin and non uh, didn't put any calcium chips neutral formalin and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. I put them in this whole battery of of uh, fixatives, and then we cut them all in, and we had the almost everybody was around, including the eyeball people, evaluate them, which was best, which was best. They couldn't decide. So what's that mean to me? Good old formaldehyde. That's all you need. And I think I might have set hmm. Leon Saunders' world back a little bit, <laughs> but I was willing to argue with him. And uh, oh, John stopped fidgeting. That's right. And um, so that ended up like that. And I told him that, but he's never really complained to me. Olufsen, we have an Olufsen short course every year at Cornell. Mm -hmm. This year will probably be the last year because I'm leaving it, unless somebody picks it up at Cornell. Oh, I no. doubt if they will. Um, they didn't like the way I did it, but now I wrote them a note and said, well, I'll let you guys do it now, and I don't think anybody's going to pick it up. Well, that tells you one thing. And, uh, and I tell them all off. I say they're lazy, but it, <laughs> I'm getting... That helps. Yeah, it does, yeah. Uh, and they're very cooperative after that. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, but uh, Leon was in on the uh, establishing the Olufsen Medal in general mm -hmm. diagnostic pathology research and teaching, or general diagnostic pathology teaching and research. And he came up to Cornell one day when we were establishing it with the one of the past deans we had. My uh, one of my chairmen's were there, and. Uh, no sense naming people, but, yeah. and uh, Dr. Crook was there and several others. And somebody said, well, they expect to get the Olufsen Medal someday. And he wasn't a basic diagnostic pathologist. He wasn't a uh, researcher, yes, but molecular biology stuff. Yeah. And Saunders says, well, I've been the head of research at a big commercial or industrial company in industry mm -hmm. and uh, Smith Klein French I guess and he says 
and I have yet to see anything those guys have turned out that was worth something, and he really put them down. Hmm. The research is his laboratory. He didn't tell my guy off, but he was telling him, you know, around the side, that it was, you know, they haven't done much for veterinary pathology, these basic researches. For human stuff, getting grant money, mm -hmm. but even it hasn't been that great. And every time you get too many PhDs in a system like Cornell or any others, on the faculty, what do they teach? Or what if times get rough? Right now, money is being pinched. Mm -hmm. If those guys don't have money, what can they do in research? Because they're not getting money. What can they do in teaching veterinary students or, or service? You know, necropsy is not a darn thing worthwhile. Or they yeah. can give a lecture. Because we do have one guy who gave PCRs. Uh, what's that? PCR. Are you asking me the yeah. quiz questions? Yeah, there? quiz questions. PCR. Yeah. You know, chain yeah. What the what reaction? Polymerase chain reaction. Yeah, polymerase chain. I, I even forget. But I listen, and I actually got something out of it. So he was, uh, but I didn't get the name. Uh, but I was impressed. You got to write it down. <laughs> yeah, I better do that. PCR. Yeah, and I thought that was very nice. But after five minutes, what else would he have to give to us? as veterinarians, as veterinary pathologists, nothing. Hmm. And I'm in, but that's what the bucks are, because I think our dean, for instance, he gets, if we get a million dollars from the, the army, if they were crazy enough to give us a million dollars for research, the dean gets 600,000 of it, because hmm. that's their overhead or whatever. They have to pay for their share of toilet paper and paper clips and pencils and water, whatever. And I understand that a little bit, but if veterinary medicine could do it itself, because we get lots of stuff the MD types don't have a clue about. AFIP is uh, hosting us, but this clearly is not very linear. <laughs> we, I don't understand. Well, just as we uh, work our way through other uh, topics, you know, starting off with the people and then up with the toilet paper scenario. I don't understand. We, t we tend to wander. <laughs> In yes. the conversation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> well, get me back in line. <laughs> right. And I wanted to stay on the uh, people part of it and finish up with Saunders and see who uh, Saunders you wanted is, to mention. Saunders is great. Uh, and all of you, you can't forget your wives. My wife, Marie, she's 50 years next year. And uh, it's been wonderful. It couldn't be better. And you need somebody. You know, it's supposed to be 50 50. Uh uh. She might say it's 90-10 in my favor, but I don't think it's that bad. But <laughs> I admit, it. Uh, there's a joke goes around sometime, they call her Saint, Saint Marie for some reason, and I don't have a reason, I don't have a guess. We all know. Uh -huh. <laughs> Saint Marie. Did but you ever, absolutely. Uh, part, do you participate in her bird watching? That's hers. I take her there, and every now and then if there's a rare bird alert, and mm -hmm. she's got to travel 300 miles north. Uh, ever see a great gray owl sit in a pole and just turn his head around like that? What a stupid thing to do when there's 400,000 people all watching a stupid bird turning his head around because he was blown 4,000 miles off his track, you know, but I had to drive her up there. But on the way up, some kid gave a fabulous talk on the monarch butterflies and their migration route to Mexico and stuff. Mm. So I learned something. So I didn't mind doing that, but that's about the only way. Oh, she went to the Antarctic, and who do you think paid? The renter's rent downstairs <laughs> From <laughs> that, you and she your collects, that she collects. Ah. And, uh, and then she went to the Danube, and she saw all the birds there, and she's been every place in the world. She's one of the, she's the keenest birder going. She's well, really she is a saint to tolerate you, and she's a very lovely person. Thanks. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Okay, now what? I haven't been able, I feel, to get you to say enough about some of the uh, early recognition of the diseases or those that you uh, really had a part of. And uh, nobody would believe you're humble, but uh, I've got to get you to bring out some of that uh, information. If, it was a, if I had studied it and tried to make the answer, I would think I was smart. But I didn't study these things, so... Give me a hint as to which ones you want. I don't care. Well, them. the world will judge whether or not you were smart or somebody outside of this room, but um, 
we covered the brain heart. What about the vitamin K induced renal toxicosis or red maple or brown dog gut or? Uh, oh, myo myometaplasia. That was Sam Thompson's. Uh, the brown granules in the dogs that you see in the gut, it'll make a, uh, it used to be called maple sugar intestine. And Nocknubble did this back in 1918, I believe, or 1923. Mm -hmm. he, he biliary fissionated the dogs and all their guts became brown. About as brown, good brown to be as brown as this, uh, this chair. Um, and then it gets lighter like the rug and, uh, and then you can barely see it. Well, I graded them one to six. This would be a six, the rug would be about a four, and I could see a two. I couldn't see a one. One was always histological. But Sam called them lyomyometoplasts, and he wrote it up originally like that. And I had 100 cases. But then uh, Don Cordes came along from uh, New Zealand, and he mm -hmm. went, he was, a, he was a Connecticut of all places. You were there for a while, weren't yeah. you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Van Krenigan. Yeah. And uh, he did his PhD on it to show that it was a vitamin E deficiency uh, thing. So, but I'd already had a hundred cases and I reported on it somewhere, but uh, mine was just because I saw it like that. It was a fantastic disease. And then I didn't see it from 1960 till about 1968. It disappeared, I don't know where. And then you just see a few cases every now and then as a vitamin E thing. Mm -hmm. Okay, what's, what's the other one you asked? Uh, vitamin K toxicosis in vitamin the horse, K. is that a real? Is yeah, that a real I, thing? Yes, that's a real thing. Some veterinarian back in 19, early 70s, he had uh, treated a horse, and the horse got sicker than heck, and he didn't know why, and it had blood in the urine and all this stuff, and uh, he didn't tell me why. But I autopsied the horse four years later because it went downhill. And when I autopsied, it had the funniest kidney disease. I didn't know what it was. And it was segmental. It was a segmental pigmentation and fibrosis. And that was the first clue that I ever had of single-dose renal disease. And I usually, for anybody in the audience, for, or liver, what causes post-necrotic scarring? If I pushed you and asked you, well, I'm not quizzing you here, but mm -hmm. I would ask my kids, uh, my kids, remember some of my kids are 40, yeah. <laughs> 45 years old, you know, when they come to be a resident or something. Actually, it's nice to be referred to as a kid now. <laughs> <laughs> and I would ask them, well, how do you explain, if you're looking at the whole kidney, this area is damaged, this area damaged, and this area is partly damaged? Well, you must explain it, in my humble opinion, because it is humble. Of course. Yeah, unless you want to fight it. And, uh, and that is that you have, you know, five vessels going to any part of your liver, five million, five, 5,000, 500, whatever number you want. But let's, for easy numbers in my mind, you get five vessels. How many of them are working at any one time? Three. Three. So if the poison is only exposed to the kidney or the liver for, you know, 20 seconds after you've ingested it or inject, injected it, whatever, it'll affect this area, that area, and that area, and won't hurt these areas. And if it's enough and severely toxic enough, it only went there, there, and there, and really damaged it, and you get these areas of necrosis or pigmentation like in the kidney. If it's absorbed, goes to the kidney quickly, and then it's diluted and doesn't hurt anymore, then you'll see this single dose effect. And that's what makes this post-necrotic uh, liver and post-degenerate kidney. And the same goes for vitamin K, because that's what happened in these vitamin K horse. He was getting foundered, and the veterinarian loaded him. And years after, I sent it out as chronic renal disease, multifocal, something like that, pigmentary yeah. nephrosis. He told me he did it. Well, subsequent to that, Rebune and ever, everybody else has proven it. You need a degree of dehydration to get it. Uh, probably the horse was dehydrated. I don't know, but I imagine. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we see it, and it, it's, it explains a single dose effect very well. Here's you your be working at what you want to ask about. Right. Here's your common, new, and different ideas and lesions in domestic uh, animals. And uh, gosh, I don't know how many pages it is, but it's far too many to discuss. But maybe you see one you like to know about. Right. Or some 
there are uh, some in here that I know that you've uh, highlighted. What about the shipping fever of horses? The, the Australians just worked that out. I would usually ask my, my students and never, well, what's the most common cause of pneumonia in New York State? And I could ask you that because you were up there for a while. And it would be shipping fever pneumonia of horses hmm. where they tie the horse's head in such a way that he cannot throw his head and snort and clean his nose like you and I I guess you know if you're a real farmer you can do it with your thumb or however you do it and then snort and you'll you'll uh, clean your darn sinuses or whatever or think you do well that's what happens to the horse and the Australians actually did that and proved it that if you hold a head in a position they can't do it the post nasal drip will drip into the lungs if there's not a lot of dust on the ride then you'll get a little bit of inhalation cranial ventrally and it's a fabulous entity uh, now will you cover this when you go through your Kodachromes yes because it's something new and different and yeah. it is the single most common cause of pneumonia in horses in New York State that doesn't hurt them very much unless there's lots of material they bring down and then you'll get a good inhalation pneumonia and always secondary to that uh, I love to fight this one for anybody is the most common cause of inhalation of empyema which is pus in the chest mm -hmm. anywhere is uh, ruptured lung abscess now I say that without reading the history right. I say that without knowing ahead of time if I see the lesion if it's got empyema that's a difficult one to to teach all the interns and residents the problem there is we have new residents and interns every year and they come from every podunk university Ohio North Carolina and if I haven't got one of my protégés, one of my spies in there teaching them this stuff. You got to, the clinicians will come and say, oh, that sounds like bull. Who's ever heard of that? And then you have to start at square one again for them. We had a calf with a big uh, pulmonary abscess, and I had left it at that. And you said, well, what'd you find? And I said, well, it's pulmonary abscess. And you made uh, me, and you participated in it, uh, pass all the pus and so forth through a sieve. You remember that? Sure. Yeah, in an oat hole. Oat hole. Fantastic. I got a good memory for a. Well, there was a lot man. of stress at the time, <laughs> and I think that's the other reason people remember that. Um, that's great. Well, I made some impression on you. Oh, it makes people a believer, too. Yeah. It doesn't take too many of it, We uh, did that those. through a colander, yep. Uh, yeah. Found the oat hole. Seems like with red maple, when there's the first observing it in New York, I, I seem to recall Bud Tennant about had it down to that it was a uh, mix up in the, some fertilizer, it got mixed into some feed and they had maps up and were tracing it through New England and New York and were just about ready to incriminate the company. That turned out, as we all know, it was red maple, but, but it always followed storms, real good storms, the leaves wilted to make this lesion. And when I looked at it, I said, it's a pigmentary nephrosis and something damaged the blood. I didn't know what it was because all I got was a biopsy in those first few cases. And then we said, no, it's a poisoning. And uh, one of the, and finally somebody believed it because when the farmer brought in the tree, he said, well, the horse was eating this. And uh, he gave it to them and they fed it. And darn it, they didn't get the lesion. I wasn't in on that part of it, so it's not me. Uh, uh, which is okay, and I don't mind not being in on it, except that I said it was a poisoning because mm -hmm. that's what would make this pigmentary nephrosis. And that, that turned out pretty good. We're lucky on that one, I guess. Are vet students getting enough exposure to vet path today, especially in terms of using it, as you just did, as an investigative tool? I don't think so because... Uh, they're taught case-based things and so much detail that I don't think they're getting enough uh, because they can't ask the tutor who's teaching that because he's mm -hmm. probably not a veterinarian. And so therefore they're probably getting cheated a little bit. Maybe, maybe not, and maybe it does make them read more material. But Donald, yeah. this is a book. And I don't care what book it is. You've got the price on it. <laughs> uh, haven't used a, haven't it's got used your it signature much. inside of it, too. Oh, very good. Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, now, I hand that to you, 
and you're a sophomore student or junior, senior, whatever, and I say, well, you'll get the information in here. Now, what do you think of all that information in there? Is it all gospel? You bet, because I wrote it, <laughs> right? However, I'm glad you beat me to the answer on that. Very one. good. Because you know darn well some of this stuff is absolutely wrong, and there's one if you look in there on the on the the nose of the cow that's got little cysts. I said I saw it in malignant taral fever. Well, you can see it in any cow you look at it if you look at enough cows. I mean, not any cow, but yeah. you can see it incidentally. And I have no idea what caused it, but it had nothing to do with malignant taral fever except the first case, uh, first few cases or something. Because when you once see it in malignant taral fever, you'll look at all the rest of the malignant taral fever, something for the same thing, but you won't look at the other ones in between, and then you'll see it in the next one. Hey, malignant taral fever lesion, and it wasn't. So that's what, I mean, that's what happens in, uh, in some of these pictures. But you, as an undergraduate, you don't know which ones, if I gave you to study, you'd yeah. have to learn every one of these as gospel, because you don't know it isn't gospel. And you didn't bring it to a guy like me, he'll say, well, that's junk, that's baloney, this is absolutely crazy. And that's um, what they're missing. It's, it's perfect that you just went through that in the, that way for the camera because oh. <laughs> that's how you taught us pathology as sophomores. We all had to buy Jones and Hunt. I think it was a requirement. Smith and, yeah. Right, mm -hmm. Smith, Jones Smith and, and Jones, Hunt. Yeah. And we'd bring it to class, and you'd say, okay, open up a certain chapter, and then you'd start telling us what to X out, what to believe, what was BS, mm -hmm. what was bunk. Yeah. Remember, I can remember my classmate, Marina, and I were sitting there saying, I don't believe this guy is better than the book he's going through here and telling us what to believe and what not to believe. But part of it also was that you added the perspective, too, of what was so rare. Call me collect if you ever see it and what are real common things that you are going to see. Where were we? We're going through here. We just went through <laughs> another. Right dorsal colitis? Is that oh. worth the... Uh, yeah, commenting that's about stretch, stretch ulcers. Yeah, this we isn't those. a sexism thing on women, is it? <laughs> uh, I wasn't even on stage when he said that, because I know I'll get blamed for. That's the uh, nice thing about being here with you. That's right. That's who they'll remember. Uh, yeah, the right dorsal colitis was uh, Dr. Tom Vaughn. He was at yeah. Cornell for those few years, uh, making Minister. himself more wanted as a dean down in Auburn. That's why he went to Cornell, I think, because then they, when, when they lost him, they knew what they lost, because I thought he was a gentleman, a good Southern gentleman. Yes. Did you ever shake hands with that son wow. of a gun? He wow. Was, he had, had a muscles hand in stronger than Rickett's. Yep, that's the other fellow to consider, he and Rickett. Yep. Anyhow, he sent me a horse over, and I says, well, he, and we did the autopsy. I run the, I'm a little hard on the postmortem room, because if you don't, the clinicians will start telling you when to do the posts and stuff like that. Bingo. Uh, and then it all goes to heck in a handbasket. Yeah. So uh, he sent the horse over and did it in beautiful small colon. And I says, well, somebody scalded it. And, but nobody could explain how they could get the, the hot water scald all the way down the small intestine to the right dorsal colon. And then it turns out, though, and I didn't know this, that prostaglandin's involved. And prostaglandin is high concentration in that area don't know why, I don't know basics for some mm -hmm. of these things, as it is in the duodenum. So in both the foals, you get, in foals, you get the burn in the epithelial portion of the stomach and in the duodenum, whereas in horses, you get it in the right dorsal colon. Anytime you lose mucosa, as you know, you can take that gut and do that and you'll stretch connective tissue because there's no mucosa and it'll tear because it's just edematous and you'll get these stretch ulcers. They're anti-mortem because you can see the edges are trying to heal and all mm -hmm. that, but it's a new and different lesion. And that's why I have it in what's new here. The banamine, uh, banamine or butazolidin or non-steroidal, I don't know which they are. Mm -hmm. When I went to Australia and showed these, oh, those guys all got down on me in a hurry. And one vet in Western New York said, he cussed a little bit, my wife said, don't cuss today, so I'm being very careful. And he gave, job. he gave me, holy heck, in front of the whole audience, because I says, this banamine did it. And, uh, and I had the gross lesion there to show him. And uh, he says, oh, 
cussed a little bit. I use that stuff like, like uh, water. Well, you don't use that stuff like water in dehydrated animals because now I think who's a who's the girl veterinarian at the lady veterinarian? Excuse Ackley? me. No, the other one uh, who's not there. Creech. Gun. Gun. Yeah. Gun for Diane. Gun for uh, Diane. Yeah, she was the one who published it. Uh, but we had seen it for a long time before, but mm -hmm. we just didn't publish it on Banamine the right dorsal colon. She did good work on that. And we, they reproduced it at school too, so it's a nice lesion. Hey, well, we're talking about diseases. What's right, what's wrong? In the Bible, what's it say about atrophic rhinitis? We see it, and atrophic in Taiwan, or at, even at, uh, in Ithaca, croup changed the diet on the pigs and we don't see it anymore. So that's pretty good. I think it is nutritional. If you look so at it, atrophic rhinitis is bilaterally symmetrical. And how many infections? Have you ever had mumps as an adult? You probably got one big, uh, one big uh, male gonad yep. and one little one. Why not both? It's not bilaterally symmetrical. Many, in, most infections aren't bilaterally symmetrical. So why does say, everybody say atrophic rhinitis is? And for that reason, and many times you see atrophic rhinitis, you section the conchi or whatever, the turbinates, and you don't see any inflammation. Now somebody says, oh, it's pasturella toxin or something like that. I don't happen to believe it. But every time I present it, I tell people the two things. And I know everybody, I know everybody would, wants to make it bordetella or pasturella or something like that. I just can't accept it, and I don't yet. But I'm almost open-minded. Leonard had some controversial opinions. Always has, and probably always will. But Dr. Crook. Leonard Crook, right. yeah. He's, at, he's still there, and he comes in every day, although he's retired. He uh, is pretty... I, I, need, I need him. I like him. Mm -hmm. Because I send all the kids, the residents, over with any bone problems. So he still looks at the bone lesions? Yep, if you ask him to. Again, when you get older, you get a little more crotchety. Yeah. People are a little afraid of you, just like I'm worried about becoming, you know, because I get a little more set in my ways. I don't believe them. That's not quite fair to them. Mm -hmm. But I, I don't know what to do about it. That's age. <laughs> mm -hmm. If you looked at Leonard and certainly think of the bones and you said the other specialists with the different systems that you could... Uh, oh, I include him in that specialty. Yes. The fact yeah, he's retired I is, I still include him as a Cornell attribute. Mm -hmm. What would you like to be remembered for uh, in the field of veterinary pathology? I cared enough to be mean to you so you learned. I don't give a dang if you believe me or not, as long as you've learned it, because then you will be, you'll remember it, and I think it's good information. I don't know what else to say to a question like that. But I didn't mind being mean. I dread it a little bit for the people I've turned off. But if I really turned them off, because that's real life, you know, somebody's going to tell you to go fly a kite. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the real world, that you're full of beans yourself, Dr. Mutant. Uh, have they come back to say thanks to you some years later? Every now and then somebody does. Boy, that makes your day, week, and month easy. Yep. After a month, I forget it. But and perhaps justifies the next uh, encounter or torture. Yes. Mm -hmm. So teaching, teaching certainly is one of your greatest influences on the profession, I would I think. I hope so. I've worked at it. Mm -hmm. But I've also been very selfish because I know my way has been the best. And you know that's full of beans. But I pushed it because I really thought it was the best. If I didn't, why would I be stupid and do that? Yeah. Yeah. But I would have won more friends if I had been a little bit nicer. But I had no, I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't know how to handle that either. <laughs> mm -hmm. Did you have uh, goals along the way to be a, something other than what you are? Chairperson, dean. Oh no, I didn't want to be a chairperson. I know I'm too hard nosed for that because if you didn't work as hard as I did, I'd probably be upset. 
So I'd try to make you work as hard as I did. Because you know. there's no excuse like, I washed up the postmortem the other day after show and tell. 6.30 at night, show and tell. I come back at 8.30 and nobody had cleaned it up. So, I, so I'm not against work. But I was a little ticked off at everybody. But one of them was a Spanish fella. And I think I'd already told him, well, the guy's coming back in to clean it. And he didn't, so I did. Because I'm proud of the postmortem room, even as old as it's getting. But I'm still proud of the darn place. It's usually pretty darn nice. And anyhow, I, have, I need specimens for show and tells to, for the Olufsen course coming mm -hmm. up in August and other places. You know. well, we haven't mentioned the uh, show and tell that goes on the road. Right, Every where you take the van, load it up with how many buckets? Five gallon buckets? Probably 1,500 pounds of guts. And I go, we always hope never have an accident, or at least a <laughs> real bad one, because they're going to try and put this big heart in me because I'm the oldest and the little cat heart and the little yep. girl that went with us here, you know, because mm -hmm. her ear is over there. What if we have that kind of accident? Gosh forbid. Hmm. But anyhow, that's something that uh, has gone over very well. And I do all the driving because I like driving. But we sing, and one year we had Germans, French, Spanish people. We sang every song, Frere Jacques in the original language, you know, and stuff like that. And it's a good trip. On the East Coast Drive, we stopped at the Animal Medical Center mm -hmm. on Sunday afternoon, put it all in their ice box, 20, 20 big buckets like that. And then uh, the next morning at uh, 8 o'clock, we have show and tell until noontime. The kids who go with me, six, seven, or eight of them, four or whatever, uh, they go and visit the Animal Medical Center or in town, but they better be back at 12 because I'm leaving at 12. Mm -hmm. And we pack it all back. It goes in clots and uh, in paper, plastic bags and inside these big plastic containers. And then we haul that and then we go to New Bolton Center and from New Bolton Center to Blacksburg to Raleigh your place, and then Athens, Georgia, mm -hmm. and then Tifton, Georgia, and Florida. And we have show and tell every day. And you guys always carry the, get the ice for us. We put them in a plastic bag on top. Because we what's should have a uh, refrigerated van. I was going to say, what's it smell like by Florida? Uh, but every night we put it in the refrigerator, and it comes out cold in the morning for show and tell. And, and uh, by the time, it, it, it stays cool. But it's not as good as the old-fashioned clots with chloral hydrate, which is difficult to get. And this last year, we went to, uh, and, they, and you guys always take care of all my expenses, except for the van. And I get a week good. off, and uh, Cornell pays for the van. I don't know if they know that. Uh, <laughs> well, my chairman will never see this, probably, so. And I'm not sure he'll, somebody will tell him. They'll show it to him. <laughs> They'll <laughs> make it. its way over there. Yeah. What do you, when you get to Florida, is that where you Dump leave it. it? Yeah. But on the way, you guys, sometimes you save stuff. And let me yep. take your stuff on. Take ours on down. Yeah. And that's good. Or I'll photograph it because I'll bring it even back and photograph it. If I didn't believe you, what you told me, and I can't prove it, at the time I show and tell it, I'll cut it in and prove you right or wrong anyhow. And <laughs> this time we went to Columbus, Ohio. Uh, How do they like it? Oh, they all like it. Oh, everybody. I haven't said it. They all said come back. So I've been back several times to all of them. <laughs> and then Knoxville with Slauson. And oh, yeah. we go to Munson. Starkville uh, with Benning Smith. Mm -hmm. and he's still uh, at Starkville? Yeah, his home is down there, but he comes yeah. to Ithaca every summer. But uh -huh. he's retired from teaching Clinton Path. Oops, sorry. Uh -huh. Touching that machine. And then we go to Baton Rouge, and they always have a crayfish boil. Broil? Boil. I don't know. And uh, for, for all of us in beer. Mm -hmm. And uh, then we go down by the Gulf of Mexico. Remember, this last time we had three Spaniards with us. They'd never seen the Gulf of Mexico, so we all walk out in the Gulf of Mexico and then get back in the car and run like heck to Tuskegee. Mm -hmm. I stayed with a guy in Alabama who was in the Army with me in 1946. Oh, my goodness. Hadn't seen him in 50 years. <laughs> he's got a veterinarian for a daughter, and he's a friend of uh, Tom Vaughn's. Uh -huh. So we stayed two nights with him, and then we went to Tifton. Because that Southeastern Path meeting we go yeah. to. And so you do a show and tell at Tifton? Yes, and we do that at their diagnostic laboratory in Tifton after the steak dinner on Saturday night. And they always welcome me, so... 
I'm not too obnoxious, I don't think. But everybody's scared of me in our postmortem room. Yeah. But when they get through, I don't think I've ever had a group say that, or I think most of them would say it's the best rotation they've had in the vet school for two weeks of learning, hard work because I don't let the seniors out. I mean, we have we have a 24-hour service every night and weekends. I mean, when they're on duty, they're stuck two weeks in the post one room. They hate it when they get there because they've heard all these bad things. Yeah. But I'm such an angel. Why don't they all <laughs> love me? You know. And uh, but they don't when they start. Most of them do when they finish. Because sure, I joke with them, I kid them, and stuff like that. Do you go to the necropsy lab every day still? Oh, almost every day, sure. Mm -hmm. But would they still have someone else, quote, on duty? Oh, yeah. Because I'm not on duty all the time, like almost like I used to be. Because mm -hmm. I kind of refused. Uh, I go out there, and I look, and if they don't, if any of them get, you know, and the faculty gets tough about it, I just back off and look at it, won't say anything to anybody. But the students will come and bug me. Mm -hmm. And that's the way it's, or the residents. Sure. Yeah. And that's okay. I don't really... I'm not there to hurt anybody. I'm just there to say, why, why don't you think of that, you know? <laughs> like empyema. We had empyema there. They said, no, it's, it didn't have a lung abscess. They didn't feel the whole dang lung. And I, I don't give the faculty heck. I'll give that resident heck. And they know I will. But they like it. Most of them like it because they know I'm trying to teach them, mm -hmm. I think. I don't do it as nice as they think I should, maybe. But yeah, if they should be truck drivers... <laughs> I have an application, f whole blank of them that you can tear off and write in and get a application. Hmm. Are we getting the message? Yeah, that it's starting to come to an end. You've, you've indicated, if I asked you, uh, how you wanted to be remembered professionally. It was for the teaching. I think of necropsy. And how about and pathology? Personally. I hope John my son, King the person. I hope my son loves me when I'm dead, and my wife too. Mm -hmm. If you had a chance to go through this dance again, what would you do different and what would you keep just I'd the be same? Nice, I'd be a little bit nicer to the family. I'd do the same thing again. I don't think there's much. I, I'd probably keep my mouth shut a little more. Because so. I can't make a big dent when the rest of the faculty all want some in research instrument or something. And I don't think it's worthwhile. Or a new faculty member. I think they're dodos. We shouldn't get them. Somebody came up for tenure not long ago. I said, but he's not a veterinarian. He doesn't teach veterinary students. And he was supposed to have done this and that. And I says, no. Well, mine, mine's only one vote. He didn't get it. But there's 14 others who gave it to him. Well, I'm known for being, for saying that. And because it's how I feel. But they're nice people. I mean, if he was in some other department, I'd vote for him, certainly. Mm -hmm. But not in veterinary pathology, where it doesn't work. That's really being hired, because it's not his fault. It's whoever hired him in the first place's fault. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Coggins often said that we seem to end up with two different groups or two different uh, populations when we have the non-DVMs and DVMs at the veterinary college. Is that how you, I think or how I, do you feel? I, hey, Howie Evans at school, you know him? Yeah. Oh, Fabulous yes. Fabulous man. Yeah. If you want to know about why, what, here's a fish, it's dead, and you want to know, he wouldn't know why it was dead. He wouldn't know, but he knows it's everything. a bottom feeder, <laughs> and that's, how, that's where his lips are going down on the bottom, and the other's got like this. He knows that kind of stuff, which makes your work as a pathologist better. But why do we need 36 of them on the faculty? I mean, one of those guys, and, and he knows snakes, and he knows birds. And that's what we should have. And if you want more of them, pre-vet, pre-vet, pre-vet. Mm -hmm. But our people don't realize that because they think, oh, all these molecular biologists can get all the research funds. Slauson with a yeah. 13 faculty member, one PhD faculty member, uh, he's got as much research funds as our department has. And he's doing wonderful. So there is money for veterinarians. If you now, it's not seven hundred forty-two million dollars for five years or yeah. something, but nobody's starving to death there. I wonder if Dr. Evans could start his class off today the way he uh, uh, started it off. How was that? In 1970, when I had him, he he passed a bone around 
through the uh, class, and then we had to identify it. And of course, it was that immediate. And I think that was part of Cornell's education for so many of the people that were there was this question and answer. Uh, and then no one knew. And it was mm -hmm. the os penis of a walrus. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if you could start it off that way today. No, you couldn't. That's sexist. And somebody would say something about it. And that's, that's that reminds me of the os penis and the uh, secretaries. Did you want to capture that one as we no, conclude? No, we won't. It would, be, it would be a nice, humorous way to end it. But if you don't want to, I, no, I, I understand. I'd rather not, because this is national television. <laughs> <laughs> We're at the uh, end. What, you go ahead and say something that you wanted to uh, conclude with, because I've certainly uh, enjoyed this, and you know how much I respect you. And uh, without a doubt, your teaching method, as unique as it might be, it's right. I'm honored that you had me for such an occasion, but I'm also giving somebody credit, I'm not quite sure who, that they picked a wonderful young man to grill the old man, so to speak. And I thank you very You're much kind. for it. And I thank the whole organization, all of our fellows on the machines and the bright lights and all that. Thank you very much. Thank you.